وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Today inshallah ta'ala's seminar is about the importance and the value of time and the way that I plan to go over this topic and I hope to discuss it is as it shows inshallah ta'ala on your slide so as it shows on the slide I have divided the lecture into two sections I have divided the lecture and the seminar into two sections inshallah ta'ala the first part I'm going to be speaking about value and the importance of time as you can see the value and importance of time how important is time what does it mean to us what did Allah and his messenger say about time I'll speak about that that inshallah ta'ala and the second is practical steps how can we now then benefit from time once we've acknowledged and we've accepted that time is very important and it's very valuable then give us practical steps of how to benefit from it and that's what we're going to do I'm going to give you practical steps of how to benefit from time the first segment or the first section of the seminar which is value and importance of time value and importance of time I'm going to give five or six points six points I think تقريباً. we'll go through each one all of them is going to be on the slides for you or five points five points are going to be the importance and value of time point number one inshallah ta'ala so this number one falls under which segment which section section one which is the value and the importance of time you write you write um, you write these five points inshallah ta'ala the first one is blessing are primary and secondary Allah tabarak wa ta'ala has blessed us we all acknowledge that right Allah says in the Quran wa in ta'uddu ni'mat Allah la tuhsuha inna al-insana la dhalumun kaffar if you sit down and you try to count the blessings of Allah Azza wa Jalla you will never be able to if the it could be left with the slides people can all see me inshallah ta'ala just leave it with the slides if we sit down and we try to count the blessings of Allah Wallahi we will never ever, we will never be able to put a number on it we can never say Allah's blessings on us is 10,000 2 million it's too much it's too much for us to count but the scholars they divided the blessings of Allah into two primary and secondary blessings primary is the most essential and the most important the foundation of your existence is connected to these blessings and the second one is secondary blessings you will still exist you will still live but you'll struggle but you'll still live the foundation the primary blessing from them is health or oh, first of all let me put it in, in, in sequence the first one of them is al-islam 
Allah says, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَا Today I have completed اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم Today I have completed your religion unto you Okay وأتممت عليكم نعمتي And I have established my complete blessing unto you What is the blessing Allah is talking about here? Islam Islam is a blessing It's a blessing And that blessing is a foundation It's a foundation The second blessing which is a foundation is health Health is a fundamental foundation for human existence. For you to exist and to be, you have to have a type of health. The third and the one that concerns us today is Al-Zaman, Al-Waqt, time. Time is a primary blessing, primary. It is time that allows us to do righteous actions. It is time that allows us to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jalla. So time is primary. You are time that came together. Some people they say, time is gold. No, that should be corrected. Time is your life and your life is more valuable than gold. With somebody today, if someone came up to you and said to me, give me your finger and I will give you a million dollars, would you give it? You wouldn't give it, right? Because your body parts mean a lot to you, true or false? Then each and every one of us here, are, we're rich. We wouldn't sell our own part, body parts for a million dollars, a million pounds. We wouldn't do that. Because our body parts mean a lot to us. You are time that came together. Time is very valuable. It's a fundamental ni'mah from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Let me mention some verses from the Quran. Try to write them down. Allah says in the Quran, Allahu alladhi, Allah is the one. Khalaq as-samawati wal-ard, Allah created the samawat, the heavens and the earth, Allah created it. Wa anzala and Allah sent down min as-samai from the sky, ma an wuta, fa-akhraja bihi min al-thamarati rizqan lakum. And with that water, Allah brought provision, crops from the earth. Why? Rizqan lakum. So you can have, so you can eat. He did all of this for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الْفُلْكَ لِتَجْرِيَ فِي الْبَحْرِ بِفَضْلِ فِي الْبَحْرِ بِأَمْرِ And then Allah tabarak wa ta'ala allowed the boat to sail on the ocean with his command. All of this is happening because Allah allowed it to happen. وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الْأَنْهَارِ And Allah, He made the day serve you. The day Allah made it, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ He made the day serve us, work for us, allow us to see things. If it was pitch dark at daytime, it would be very hard for us to walk around. Allah made all of this to serve us. And then Allah says, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرِ Allah made the sun and the moon serve us. وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارِ The day and the night وَآتَاكُمْ And Allah brought for you and gave you مِنْ كُلِّ مَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُ Everything you asked for And look what he said after that وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا If you sit down and you try to count the blessings of Allah you will never be able to In what context did Allah say that you will never be able to count the blessings of Allah? In what context was it? Time Day Night Sun, moon, Allah has mentioned the blessing in this context. So we learn from this, time is a fundamental primary blessing. Brothers, the blessing, the blessing will only remain if we show gratitude. Gratitude is one of the things that allows us to keep the current blessing that we have. I want every one of you to remember this. The scholars, they say that gratitude is قَيْدٌ لِلْمَوْجُودِ وَصَيْدٌ لِلْمَفْقُودِ Gratitude is something that will allow the current blessing that you have remain. And gratitude brings you what you don't have. Whatever you didn't have will come your way. 
Allah will bring it for you. And what you already have, Allah will let it remain for you and stay consistent and continuous for you. Did he not say in the Quran, لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you show gratitude to me, I will increase it for you. Increasing means what? I will let what is already there to remain and I will give you more addition. So the blessings, they will stay and they will be continuous if we show gratitude. Time is a blessing. If we show gratitude to time, it will remain for us. How, how would time remain for us? Allah will give us the ability to benefit from it. And I will be speaking about that at the ending of the at the, end of, at the ending of the seminar, Bidnilain Kari. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He removed excuses. There is no excuse for the individual who's been allowed to live for 60 years. In the eyes of Allah, there's no excuse. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he said in a hadith, Al Imam al-Bukhari you narrated on the authority of Abu Hurairah. Allahu Azza wa Jalla. Allah made a person without excuses the day of Jannah. There's nothing you can say. You have no excuses on the table. Here. That Allah allowed him to live for 60 years. If Allah gives you time to live for 60 years, what type of excuse can you come with the day of judgment? You can't. There's nothing for you to say the day of judgment. Allah has removed that from you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no excuse for you. And that's why we come to the next point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he scolded. He told off the disbelievers. Also, the Muslims who waste their time. Allah told them off. It's on, your, uh, it's on the slide. Allah told off. He reprimanded subhanahu wa ta'ala the disbelievers for wasting their time. What did Allah say? Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he said in Surah, surah Fatir, Surah Fatir, Ayah 37, Allah says, أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرْكُمْ مَا يَتَذَكَّرُ فِيهِ مَنْ تَذَكَّرَ وَجَاءَكُمْ Allah says, أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرْكُمْ have we not given you a light span? Have we not given you time? Did we not give you umr? A time? A life? In that time, what could you do? Where you can become conscious and aware of your actions. A time you could be contemplating, pondering over your own doings. Have I not given it to you? Some of the scholars, they said, this means if you reach age of puberty. Some of the scholars, they said, it means if you reach age of puberty, anyone who's reached age of puberty, Allah has given them the time to contemplate and ponder. And the warner came to you. Some of the scholars, they said, the warner is that Allah brings a white hair in your bed or your hair white hair I'm a grey hair white beard this is the warner what is he telling you? your time is coming to an end soon you will meet your Lord Allah Azza wa Jalla so anyone who those two has been given to him first of all you reach age of puberty that was a that was a time and then after that just in case you forgot Allah gave you a sign, a white hair came out. And here you're saying, no, no, this is just stress, man. It's just stress. SubhanAllah, I'm not old. It's just stress. It's the sign that was sent to you to be heedless, uh, to be aware and not to be heedless. And to take a sign, you're like, this is just a, this is just stress, work, just a workload that's doing this to me. No, it's a reminder telling you your time is coming to an end. You're about to expire. You're going to meet your Lord soon. So a person who's been given age of puberty, who's reached age of puberty, has no excuse based on this ayah. And then if his beard becomes white, then he's been given what? A warner, telling him that his time is going to come to an end. 
Allah swore by time. We're all to, we're talking about the importance of time and how valuable time is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He swore by time. Swore by it. Let's look at some of the verses of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala swearing by time. Allah says, yagsha. The night, Allah swears by. Wannahari Ida Tajalla, Allah swears by the day. Wallayli Ida Adbara was Subhi Ida Asfar. Allah swears by the night and then He swears by the morning. Wallayli Ida As Asa was Subhi Ida Tanafas. Well Fajiri Walayalin Ashr. Wal Duha Wallayli Ida Saja. Wal As in Al Insana Lafi Hus. All of those Allah is swearing by it. Nailayl, Nahar, Al Fajr, Al Duha. Why is he swearing by it? Li Ahmiyatiha. Because of its importance. Because of how great it is. Allah swearing by it. It means a lot. It shows that how important time is. And how valuable time is. And here we are, heedless about it. Unaware of it. We don't. We're unaware of what is, what is with us. This time, brother, that you've been given, that Allah is swearing by, if you do not busy yourself with good, that free time, that you're not doing anything, you're wasting your time, it will, you, it will benefit from you and it will make you do wrong. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah said a statement that I came across one of the scholars. When you come into his house, it used to be written on the door of his house, which is what? Nafsuka aman nafsaka. You can say it both ways. Illam tashghalha bil-ta'a shagalatka bil ma'asiyah. If you don't busy your time in obedience of Allah, it will busy you in the disobedience of Allah Azza wa Jalla. If you don't busy this nafs and you don't busy it with the obedience of Allah, it will busy you in the disobedience of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Nafsuka illam tashghalha bil-ta'a Your nafs if you do not busy it with the obedience of Allah, shagalatka bil ma'asiyah, it will busy you with the disobedience of Allah. And I know many of us can agree to this. That when you don't busy, you don't have a schedule, and you don't have a timetable, and you don't have a routine to follow, if you give yourself that free time, this nafs is very evil. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءٌ This nafs is going to call you to evil. It's going to try to destroy you. It's going to try to make you go astray. It is going to make you disobey Allah Azza wa Jalla. I want you to ponder here. The poet, he said, وَالنَّفْسُكَ طِفْلِ إِن تُهْمِلْهُ شَبَّعَلَى حُبِّ الرَّبَاعِ وَإِن تُفْطِمْهُ يَنْفَطِمِ Your nafs is like a newborn baby. Please remember this. This nafs of yours is like a newborn baby. Like a newborn baby. The newborn baby, the child when it reaches two years of breastfeeding, the mother has to say to the child, now it's over. There's no breastfeeding for you anymore. Based on the ayah, The mother breastfeeds the child for how many years? Two years. After two years, the mother stops breastfeeding the child. The child, if the mother doesn't stop breastfeeding him after two years, and she carries on, the child will still carry on the breastfeeding. Five years, he'll still take it. The scholars, they said, it is upon the mother to say, nope, it's over. The nafs is like that. Your nafs will just drag on and it will do what it wants. You have to say to your nafs, stop. When nafsu katifli, your nafs is like the child. In tuhmilhu, if you forsake it, shabba'ala hubbir rabai, it will be like the child who's been breastfed. They'll say, okay, I did this sin, can I do another one? Oh, can, what about this one? Don't worry, just let's, let's have a one hour fun. I want to play with this game or I want to, I want to do this. 
And tomorrow you see yourself 10 hours, you're sitting down every day wasting your time. It started from what? One hour. The nafs will go on. You're sleeping too much. You're relaxing. I'm just going to talk on the phone. I'm just going to use my gadget, my mobile phone for this much. You have to grab yourself. You have to grab this nafs and restrain it or it will go out of place. It will. Another poet, he said, إِنَّ الشَّبَابَ وَالْفَرَاغَ وَالْجِدَ مُفْسِدَةٌ لِلْمَرْءِ أَيُّ مفسدة? The youth, the youth who has time, free time, the youth and free time and money. These three, Mufsidatul lil mar'i, they corrupt a person, a great corruption. Three things, being a youth. Generally the youth, he is what? He is hasty, he wants to do so many things. He's, there's a Somalian proverb, there's a Somalian saying, which is, a youth... My Somali is not that good, so I'll say in English. The youth, he jumps from decisions like, he, like, he's, like when he's young, he can jump fast. The youth, he, he's young, so he's fragile, he's tough, he's, he's athletic, so he knows how to jump. He jumps like that from wise decisions. The youth, the youth, if he doesn't have any deficiencies that the youths normally have, if he's an upright child, Allah is amazed with him. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi said in a hadith, "Inna Allah la ya'jabu." Allah is amazed and he is fascinated. Subhanahu wa taala, min al-shabi laysat lahu sabwa. Allah is amazed with a youth who doesn't have the deficiency of a youth. Because generally when you're young and you're a youth, you don't have that tranquility, that wisdom to think. A lot of the times you're hasty and you're fast in things. Allah is amazed. Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah graded this hadith to be Hassan in his Kitab al-Aqidatul Wasatiyah. Allah is amazed, fascinated. And that's why the youth, the day of judgment, he has a shade when no one else is going to gain a shade except seven types of people. And he's from one of the ones who get Sab'atun. يُضِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّهُ Seven. Allah is going to give him a shade the day when there is no shade. From them is who? شَابُ النَّشَأَ فِي طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ A youth who was nurtured, who grew up in the obedience of Allah Azza wa The reason is because the youth hasn't had enough time to think. He hasn't had enough time to experience things in life. So for him to know how to benefit from the little time that he's lived this world and to be wise inside it has allowed him to have the shade of Allah the day of judgment. Allahu Akbar. It goes back to the concept of time. It really goes back to the, the concept of time. Brothers, I, in Ramadan, I came across an ayah. Many of us have already read this ayah. Allah Ta'ala says in the ayah, فَلَا تَعْجَلْ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّمَا نَعُدُّ لَهُمْ عَدَّا The last part is what concerns me from the ayah. Allah says, we will count it fully. We will count it fully. فَلَا تَعْجَلْ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّمَا نَعُدُّ لَهُمْ عَدَّا the scholars, they said that this thing that's going to be counted is your life. The minutes, seconds, they will be counted. It's all going to be counted. It's all counted for Allah Azza wa Some of the scholars like Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyim, he took it a step further and he said, Adda means their breathing is counted for us. When you breathe in and when you breathe out, it's all counted for Allah Azza wa it's not, the angels are aware of your situation. Allah is aware of it. You're the one who's heedless. The 
only one who's heedless, he was just wasting his time and he's saying, don't worry, I will do it when I grow older. It's you. Like in everything else is working. It's doing their job. And they are doing their job. It's just you who's not. Who's not benefiting from your time. And who's not taking his time very serious. And there will come a day, brothers, where you will regret the time that you have forsaken, that you did not benefit from. The Messenger told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, the Messenger told us, salawatullahi wasalam, he said, ma jalasa qawmun majlisan lam yadhkurullaha ta'ala fihi. There is not a group of people who sit in a gathering and they do not remember Allah. They sit there and they just talk. Where Ibn, uh, Ibn Mulaqid said that what they are talking about is good, is good things or, or normal things. Mubahat, not haram. They're just talking about normal things. How are you? Is everything fine? Okay, yesterday I did this. Just a normal conversation. But they don't bring Allah into the conversation. They do not talk about the deed. They talk about business and dunya, normal things that are not haram. Because they did not mention khair and good in there. Illa ra'aw yawm al qiyamati hasrah. The day of judgment, they will regret the fact that they wasted that time. Imagine those who are wasting their time on haram and disobedience of Allah. Imagine, to them, imagine those. These people were sitting there, they, they were talking about things that were permissible. That was allowed. And there will come a day, brothers, before the day of judgment, before you regret it, the day of judgment, even in this dunya, you're going to regret it. The fact that you didn't will benefit from your youth when you were young. A poet said, Mali ida jadabtu ha sa'aytu akibarun alani anbaytu Layta shababan bu'a fashtaraytu Layta wa haliyan fa'u shay'an laytu He said, he grew old he used to, everybody when they're young, they're strong, they're enthusiastic, they're, they have the strength and the ability. But this man has become old. He was a very old man. So he threw the bucket inside the well. And then he wanted to get water out. And he pulled it. And he pulled it up. And as he was pulling it, his arm and his hand could not pull the bucket out because he's old. And then he said, Mali ida jazabtu ha sa'itu. Why is it that when I try to pull out the bucket, and I try to bring it out. Why am I saying, ah, why am, am I feeling pain? I never used to feel this pain. Is it old age? Is it family responsibilities? Is it that which is made, making me heavy and old like this? And then look what he said. I wish that being a youth was something that was sold in the market. I could go and buy it just to become young again. And then he said to himself, It's just wishful thinking. It ain't going to happen. So you're going to regret it one day. You're going to regret it one day that you didn't benefit from your time. It's a blessing. The believer is the one who takes heed from that and realizes, okay, I've heard of this and I'm now going to change my life. I'm going to make sure I benefit, I benefit from my time. I want to mention the importance of time in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The messenger told us alayhi salatu wasallam in the hadith al Imam al Imam al Bukhari narrated and al Imam al Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the authority of Ibn Abbas, ni'matani maghbun fihi ma kathiru min al nas al sihhat wal farag. Two blessings. Two blessings. Many people, they don't really benefit from it. They only recognize it once it's long gone. They don't benefit from it when they have it. What are they? Time and a, uh, health. Time and health. Those are the two things that people don't recognize it. وَلِذَلِكَ health. When do people realize the health that they have? Once it's gone. But the Arabs they say, Health is a crown. It's a crown on the heads of those who are healthy. No one else can see it except the sick one. 
Health is a crown on the head of the one who's healthy. No one else can see it except the sick ones. They're like, have you not seen a rich man? I've seen it with my two eyes. A rich man, very, very rich. And he looked at a poor man and he wished that he could have what that poor man has. You might think to yourself, what is he talking about? This poor man could eat any food he wants. This poor man can eat whatever food he wants. There's a, but this rich man, the doctors have told him, don't eat this food, it's going to increase your it's gonna diabetes and this is going to do cholesterol and this and that. So he's on a, what does the food contain? This, yeah, I can't have it. He wishes he's like this poor man who what? Who has health like him. Healthy. You all know the three men. You all know the story, the famous story. The three men where the angel came to them. The one that was bald. He had no hair. One he had leprosy. And the other one was blind. Do you remember the story? When the angel came to all three of them, what was the first thing that they asked for? That Allah removes the deficiency and the illness from them first, before they ask for wealth. <coughs> health is what they ask for first. Sahih? Of course, health is very important. Health is what? It's very important. Many people don't realize it unless, until they lost it. They don't have it. They can't stand up anymore because their back is broken. Or they have mental health issues. The second one is time, free time. Many people have free time but they don't realize it. What they had. How much value that has, they realize it later. And Imam al-Bukhari said something very powerful. He said, اغتنم في الفراغ فضل ركوعد فعسى أن يكون موتك بغتا كم صحيح رأيت من غير سقم ذهبت نفسه الصحيحة فلتا Bukhari said, benefit from your free time by doing one rak'ah. Bukhari, he said this in his sahih. اغتنم في الفراغ There is, you're at work. You finished your job. You have free time. Stand up and pray to rak'ah. Don't let a minute or a second in your life go by without it being of good and benefit for you. فَعَسَى أَنْ يَكُونَ مَوْتُكَ بَغْتَ Because your death can be sudden. It could just randomly happen. You don't know. كَمْ صَحِيحٍ How many people who were healthy رَأَيْتَ مِنْ غَيْرِ سَقَمٍ Which we saw them become sick. They be, sorry, they were not sick. They were healthy. And they died with no illness. Sudden death. ذَهَبَتْ نَفْسُهُ الصَّحِيحَةُ فَلْتَ You don't know. So just pray. Increase in it. The more you increase in righteous actions, the chances of you dying in that state is very high. Isn't that not, isn't that true? So here it is. It is true. One needs to know that. The day of judgment, uh, uh, before I mention this point, the day of judgment, one of the things that we're going to be asked is time. We're going to be asked, we're going to be interrogated by who? By a Supreme Court? The one that knows what's in your heart before you even vocalize it. The one you cannot get away from. This, the creator of the heavens and the earth, Allah Azza wa Jalla. The hadith of Abi Barzat al Aslami. A slave's legs will not move from its position the day of judgment. Four questions you're going to be asked. Four. And from them is One of the four is How did you spend your life? What did you do in your life? Oh Allah, I was playing games. Is that what you want to say? Youngsters. You want to say to Allah, I was playing games all day? You're going to be asked the day of judgment, what did you do with your time? Ha get that answer ready now, today. You have that chance to get it ready today. Today is your opportunity. Make sure you get the answer for that. If you don't, 
then get ready. The Prophet said in another hadith, اِغْتَنِمْ خَمْسًا قَبْلَ خَمْسًا Benefit from five before five happens. I'm a five occur. And from them is, or the first one that the messenger mentioned was what? Shababaka qabla haramik. Benefit from your youthfulness before age hits you. Allahu Akbar. Benefit from it. Now, I want to speak about something very important. I'm going to now go into all of those evidences I gave and all of those quotes and all of those hadiths. Some of you might say, can we see it practically? Is there any people who've practiced this? Do we, can you show us, show us a people who have lived by the value of time? Yes. I have 1,112 situations. But I'm not going to go all of, through all of them. How many did I say? 1,112, each one more shocking than the other. How the Salaf, the early generation, they benefited from their time. Now I'm going to go into stories of how they benefited from their time. Please pay attention with me. We want to sh I want to show you all of these ayat and all of these hadiths, how they internalized it and how it impacted their life. The Salaf's keenness to gain Time and fill it with goodness. This is what I'm going to go through now. Salafu Hadil Ummah, the early generation, the pious pre people. I'm going to start it off by a quote. I'm going to start this with a quote. And Imam Shafi'i, Rahimahullah, he said, Sahib to Sufiya Ibn Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi'i, and Imam Shafi'i. He said, I accompanied, I went to the Sufis, Sufiya. He said, فَمَنْ تَفَعْتُ مِنْهُمْ I did not benefit anything from the Sufiya. And Imam Shafi'i is saying, إِلَّا بِكَلِمَتَيْنِ Only two words. Two words are the only things I benefited from the Sufis. What was it? الْوَقْتُ سَيْفٌ Time is a sword. فَإِنْ قَطَعْتَهُ If you cut it, then you benefit from it. وَإِلَّا Or if you don't, قَطَعَكَ It will cut you. Time is a sword. You have to cut it and slice it. And we'll speak about that later, inshaAllah ta'ala, when we come to setting yourself goals at the ending of our seminar. And the second quote was what? وَنَفْسُكَ Your nafs إِنْ لَمْ تَشْغَلْهَا بِالْحَقِّ If you do not busy it with the truth, وَإِلَّا شَغَلَتْكَ بِالْبَاطِلِ It would busy you with falsehood. And I mentioned that quote from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah as well. Let me give you some stories, inshaAllah ta'ala, that has truly amazed me, sarahatan. Amazed me. I'm going to mention them, inshaAllah ta'ala. And you all will be amazed with me, bi'ithni ilayhi al-kareem. You'll all be amazed with me. The first one is the striving and the hard work of the Salaf. Hold the sun so I can talk to you. This is Amir ibn Abdi Qais, who was one of the Tabi'een. A Tabi'i is the student of the companion. One of the Tabi'i. One of the students of the companions. His name was Amir ibn Abdi Qais. A man said to him, Kalimni, talk to me. Talk to me. فَقَالَ لَهُ عَامِرِ بْنُ عَبْدِ إِقَيْسِ said to him, أَمْسِكِ الشَّمْسَ Hold the sun so I can talk to you. Hold the sun. Don't let time move and then I'll talk to you. He didn't want to waste his time. He believed talking to that person would waste his time. And so he said, if you want me to talk to you and engage with you, then make sure time is not moving. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the noble companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look what he said, Ma nadim tu, I never regretted. 
شيء I never regretted anything ندمي على يوم غربت شمسه A day where the sun set نقص فيه أجلي And my time was reduced Meaning I was closer to my grave And the meeting of Allah وَلَمْ يَزِدْ فِي عَمَلِي And my actions did not increase That was the time I regretted the most I never regretted anything else The greatest re regret for me was My time Meeting Allah was close And I didn't benefit from that day Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is saying He regrets a day that passes of his life Which he didn't benefit from Which he didn't take from it Al-Nahar Al-Layl wa Al-Nahar Ya'malani fika fa'mal Fihima Night and day Are ever working on you They are doing their thing Why are you not doing your thing? Why are you, why are you not exerting effort? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz Was the one who said this He said Inna al-Layl The night Wa Al-Nahar And the day, يعملان فيك, they are working on you. They are doing their course. They are doing what they were commanded by Allah. فعمل فيهما, work in them. How are they working? They're reducing your life. The day and the night that's going by is taking away from you your what? It's taking away your life. You're growing older every day. Why are you not benefiting from that time? Why are you not exerting efforts in the good and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? O son of Adam, you are but days. Hassan al-Basri was the one who said this. He said, Ya bna Adam, O the children of Adam, Inna ma anta ayyam, you are days. Fa'idha dahaba yawmun, if a day goes by, Some of you will go with it. If a day goes by, remember that some of you went with it. Every day. Hamad ibn Salama. Hamad ibn Salama. Before I go into Hamad ibn Salama, there was something I didn't mention in my PowerPoint presentation that I want to mention now and I want you to look at this it really amazed me I think this was one of the most amazing ones that I came across Sufyan al-Thawri write this one down Sufyan ibn Sa'id al-Thawri rahimahullah Khatib al-Baghdadi mentioned in his kitab Al-Jami'u li-Akhlaq al-Rawi wa Adab al-Sami' that Sufyan al-Thawri you He entered onto Hamad ibn Salama. He entered onto Hamad ibn Salama. Sufyan al-Thawri. That's his teacher. He entered onto him. And he didn't give him no salams. He entered and he sat down and he asked him a question straight away. Okay. When he asked him the question, after that he gave him salams and he hugged him. And so Hamad ibn Salama was amazed with him. And he said to him, Man anta, who are you? Because he didn't know who he was. He said, oh, who are you? This was the first time Sufyan al-Thawri met Hamad ibn Salama. Two great imams. Two great imams. Sufyan al-Thawri walks on to Hamad ibn Salama. And what does he do? He asks him the question straight away. Once he's finished asking the question, he gives him a salam and he shakes and he hugs him. Hamad ibn Salama said to him, Man anta, who are you? Qala ala Sufyan, I'm Sufyan. Hamad ibn Salama said to him, Ibn Sa'id, are you the son of Sa'id? He said, Naam. Al-Thawri, are you Thawri? Sufyan al-Thawri. Qala Naam. Qala Abu Abdillahi, are you Abu Abdillahi? Qala Naam, he said, yes I am. And Hamad ibn Salama then said to him, Fama mana'aka an tusallim alayya? What prevented you from greeting me? Why didn't you greet me? Why didn't you shake me? Why didn't you say salam alaikum to me? And then why didn't you then ask me the question? And then why did you not ask me about the hadith? He said, I was scared. And that you die. 
قبل أن أسمع الحديث منك before I can hear the hadith from you. I'm scared. While I'm greeting you and hugging you, you might drop dead. And then I don't get the hadith I came for. So I asked you quickly, you gave me the hadith, then I shake your hand and I greeted you. Doesn't want to waste time. He does not want to, he doesn't want to waste time. Here I'm going to mention Hamad ibn Salama was either narrating. Look at this man's life, Hamad ibn Salama, the one I just spoke about now, the Shaykh, the teacher. His life was either narrating hadiths of the Prophet, or he was reading, or he was glorifying Allah or praying. He would either be narrating hadith, or he would be reading, or he would be glorifying Allah by saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, or he would be in a salah. Nothing else. And Imam with the he says, About Hamad ibn Salama al Basri, al Imam al Muhaddith al Nahwi al Hafid al Qudwa to Shaykh al Islam. He was an Imam, he was a grammarian, he was a scholar of hadith, and he was a, a role model. His life he divided into those types. He narrates a hadith, he reads, he glorifies Allah, or he prays, those four. This, was, this, this really shocked me. Listen to this. Abd al-Rahman ibn Mahdi said, Abd al-Rahman ibn Mahdi is the student of Abd al-Hamad ibn Salama. Please, brothers, please ponder on this. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. This is shocking. Abd al-Rahman ibn Mahdi said, Law qila li Hamad ibn Salama. If it was said to Hamad ibn Salama, Inna ka tamutu ghadan. Tomorrow you're going to die. Ma qadara, he was not able an yazida fil amali shay'a. He could not increase in his righteous actions. If he was told that tomorrow the angel of death is coming, he's going to take your nafs, you're going to die. Hamad ibn Salama had already exhausted himself. There was nothing else he could do. Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi said this about him, his own student. <coughs> and Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi was the teacher of Imam Shafi'i. Great Imam. The believers, they always live their life as though this can be the last minute. Your last moments in this world, Wallahi, we don't know. We don't know when we're going to die and when we're going to meet Allah Azza wa Jalla. We work hard every day. This is what we do. The most burdensome time for Khalil ibn Ahmed was his meal time. Khalil ibn Ahmad al-Farahidi was the teacher of the father of grammar. Sibawihi, the father of grammar is Sibawihi, right? Sibawihi's teacher was Khalil ibn Ahmad al-Farahidi, this is the teacher. Khalil ibn Ahmad al-Farahidi, the time that he hated the most, that he found to be the most burdening, was the time he would eat. Hated it. Abu Hilal al-Askari mentioned in his kitab Al-Hathu ala talab al-ilm wal ijtihadi fi jam'i He said Kan al-Khalil ibn Ahmad al-Farahidi al-Basri ahad al-Kiya al-Alam And he was born the 100 years at the 100th year of the Hijriya and he died 170 Hijriya Khalil ibn Ahmad al-Farahidi He said Athqal al-Sa'ati alayya The hardest time on me The burdensome Time on me was Sa'atun akulu fiha My meal time It was the hardest It was extremely hard Fallahu Akbar We enjoy meal time We get ready, get the family ready Sit on the table, roll up our hands huh? And we love it We chit chat, we spend time, coffee These salaf wallahi rahimahumullah May Allah have mercy upon them. May Allah have mercy upon these men and these women. Wallahi, great imams. Amazing people. And that's why they reached what they reached. That's why they reached the station that they reached. Abu Yusuf, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa. This one shocked me. He discussing a matter on, of fiqh on his deathbed. He's on his deathbed. He's dying. 
last moments of his life. And he's discussing a fiqh issue. He wants to, he wants to know it. Let me mention the story for you. His student, Al Qadi ibn Ibrahim, Qadi Ibrahim ibn al Jarrah al Kufiyu, he said, Marida Abu Yusuf, Abu Yusuf became sick. Ill. Fa'ataytu So I came to visit him. Al Qadi Ibrahim ibn al Harbin, he said, I came to visit Abu Yusuf. Ah, I came to visit him. Fawajatuhu mughma. When I entered onto him, he was unconscious. He was fainting. Unconscious, Abu Yusuf. So I stayed, I sat next to him, and then he became conscious again. He regained consciousness. As soon as he saw me, he said to him, Ibrahim ibn al-Harb, What would you say about an issue? And then Qadi Ibrahim ibn al-Harb, he said, I said to him, في مثل هذه الحالة, At this situation, you're on your deathbed, you're going to ask me a fifth question? And then he said to him, there's no problem in this. Nadrusu. We will benefit from one another and take benefit from this moment. We may need to save ourselves from this particular situation. And then he asked a question. He said, Ya Ibrahim, Ibrahim, Ayyuhuma Afdalu, which one is more better? Fi Ramal Jimar, the one who is throwing the stone in Hajj in the pilgrimage. When you're throwing the stones. Which one is better? And yarmiha mashiyan that the person throws the stones whilst walking or whilst he's mounted on his riding beast. Which one is better? Qadi Ibrahim ibn Harbin, he said, I said to him, whilst mounted on his riding beast, he said, Akhta'ta, you got it wrong. I said, okay, walking. He said, Akhta'ta, you also got it wrong. And then I said to him, Qul fiha, then say what you think is right. And then he said, if he comes to a situation where he needs to make dua, it is better that he is He should stand at those particular places and make the dua whilst he's standing. But if it's situations where he's not in a state of dua, then it's better to do it whilst he's mounted. A meaning the issue has tafsil. And then Al-Qadi Ibrahim ibn Harbin, he said, I stood up and I left him. When I reached the door of his house, I heard him passing away. I heard him passing away. And he died. Last moments of his life. No, this is not shocking. Listen to this one. Abu Yusuf, the same Imam. I promised you this is going to be the most amazing a'imma of their life. Abu Yusuf, his son died and he didn't want to participate in the janazah of his son. And he told other people to do it. So he can participate in a circle of knowledge. Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah, he was shadidul mulazama. He really stuck with Imam Abu Hanifa. Until he became the shade of Imam Abu Hanifa. He was Abu Hanifa Shaykh. Shadidul Mulazama. He never left Al Imam Abu Hanifa. They said he left him once. He became sick. And even then, he asked his children to carry him and bring him in the masjid. Al Imam Abu Yusuf. He mentioned Rawa Muhammad ibn Qudama taqala sami'tu Shuja'a ibn Makhladin qala sami'tu Abu Yusuf in Yakulu. Abu Yusuf said, Ma tabnul li. One of my sons died. One of my son, he died. فَلَمْ أَحْضُرْ I did not participate in jihazahu. I did not participate in the washing of his body. وَلَا دَفْنَهُ And not also in his burial. I did not participate. وَتَرَكْتُهُ And I left that responsibility with عَلَى جِيرَانِ My neighbors وَأَقْرِبَائِ And my relatives مَخَافَةَ Because I was scared أن يفوتني أن يفوتني من أبي حنيفة شيء لا تذهب حسرته عني. that I might miss a lesson of Imam Abu Hanifa and the regret for missing that lesson will forever haunt me. I couldn't. His own flesh and blood. He didn't participate in his janazah. He didn't wash his body. Would a man like that waste any time in anything 
This is also okay. Another student of Imam Abu Hanifa, Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah. لا ينام من الليل إلا قليلا. He would only sleep little at night, very little at night. العلامة طاج كبري زادة. He mentions in his kitab مفتاح السعادة ومصباح السيادة. He said. كان محمد بن الحسن الشيباني الكوفي البغدادي الإمام الفقيه المجتهد المحدث تلميذ الإمام أبي حنيفة رحمه الله تعالى لا ينام الليل he wouldn't sleep at night he wouldn't he wouldn't وكان يضع عنده دفاترة what he would do is bring his books and he would read and he would read and he would read محمد بن الحسن الشيباني he would read 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 so much فَإِذَا مَلَّا If he becomes bored, he picks up another book. And then he reads the other one. And then he reads the other one. And then reads the other one. And when he feels tired and he can't keep his eyes open, he will stand up and he would wash him, he would shower with cold water. And he would say, إِنَّ النَّوْمَ مِنَ الْحَرَارَةِ Sleeping comes from heat. Ah. So I'm going to and he used to do that. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Isam al-Balkhiyu. Isam al-Balkhiyu. He bought a pen for one dinar because he heard something and he couldn't, he didn't want to waste his time running around and looking for a pen. He said, Can anyone give me a pen? I'll give them one dinar. One dinar is equivalent to today, a hundred dollars taqreeban. He doesn't want to waste time. He just wants the pen. Straight away to write the hadith. Because his current pen finished. Allama Tash Kubri mentions that in his kitab, Miftahu Sa'ada. He bought a pen for one dinar. Some of those great scholars, they actually they will sell their houses so they can travel to an imam they will travel they would hear an imam is alive and he has a hadith one hadith imagine this brothers and sisters one hadith one hadith he wants to hear the hadith from the mouth of the shaykh he doesn't want this long chain and so he will sell his house to get the money so he can do what so he can travel and go to the Shaykh. So he would come home to his wife and he would say to his wife, I've sold the house, come out of it. I've sold the house, it's not ours anymore, get out, bring the children out. All because he wants to go and get one hadith. He wants to hear it from one Imam. If those people did not do that, and if they did not sacrifice their life like that, we would not have had this religion the way that we have it today. Allah protected his religion through them. For me, uh, the poet said, فَسُنَّةُ النَّبِيِّ وَحِيٌّ ثَانٍ عَلَيْهِ مَا قَدْ أُطْلِقَ الْوَحِيَانِ وَإِنَّمَا طَرِيقُهَا الرِّوَايَةِ فَافْتَقَرَ الرَّوِي إِلَى الدِّرَايَةِ بِصِحَّةِ الْمَرْوِيِّ عَلْ رَسُولِ لِيُعْلَمَ الْمَرْدُودُ مِنْ مَقْبُولِ لَا سِيَّمَا عِنْدَ التَّظَاهُرِ الْفِتَنِ وَلَبْسِ إِفْكِ الْمُحَدِّثِينَ بِالسُّنَنِ فَقَامَ عِنْدَ ذَلِكَ الْأَئِمَّةِ بِخِدْمَةِ الدِّينِ وَنُصْحُ الْأُمَّةِ فَمَيَّزُوا صَحِيحَهَا مِنْ مُفْتَرَى حَتَّى صَفَتْ نَقِيَّةً كَمَا تَرَى It was those scholars who stood up. And what did they do? They served this religion. They sacrificed their life today. So this religion can come to us the way it came to us. Is it then fair that we play with the religion that they fought for? The religion that they got beat for? They got lashed, they lost their lives. Is it fair that today we just play around with that religion, we dismiss it, we distort it, we choose and we pick what we want to follow from it? It's a religion that Nabiullah Muhammad, Kusirat Ruba'iyatu, his front teeth was broken because of this religion. He lost his noble companions, his family members, his uncles. It's not a religion you should play with, honor it. And Imam Muhammad was lashed. Until we couldn't raise his hand anymore. Abu Hatim al-Razi traveled so much to gather the Prophet's hadith. 
so much so that the heat hit his head and he urinated blood. Those people, their legacy and their hard work, we should honor it. By taking this religion extremely serious, by respecting it. And now we're going to go into another example. Ubaid ibn Ya'ishin. This story, it shocked me because it's not one or two years. 30 years, Ubaid ibn Ya'ishin, 30 years his sister would give him food. His sister. So he can just write hadith, he doesn't want to waste his time to not benefit. For 30 years his sister will give him food to eat. And he would eat, and he would eat, and he would eat. Rahimahumullah jami'an. May Allah honor these great scholars. And Imam with the mentions that uh, he said, Qala Ammar ibn Raja'in Samirtu Ubaid ibn Ya'ish and Yaqulu Akam to Thalatina Sanata. I stayed for 30 years. Ma akaltu bi yadi bil layli. I never ate with my hand at night. Never. No hand. Kanat ukhti, my sister, tulakimuni wa ana akhtu bil hadith. She would feed me while I would write the hadith. That was her role. May Allah honor his sister who served the religion in her way as well. This was not unique to him only. Same was Al-Imam Al-Nawi. I came across uh, Al-Imam Al-Nawi, rahimahullah, that when he was on his last moment in this life and he was about to die, that his sister said to him, she used to feed him. And Imam al never got married. His sister used to feed him. She used to give him food and he would write the hadiths and she would prepare everything for him. And when he was on his last moments, his sister said to him, I love you, Nawi. I really loved you and I love you and you're going to depart from me and you're going to leave this world. Why didn't you leave a offspring, a child of yours, so I can cherish that child. I can remember that child through you. If only you did that for me. And Al Imam al said, I forgot to get married. And if I did remember it, I would have done it. Hajib. When I look at these people's biography and the way that they were, it is not something normal the way they are. Now I want to talk about, there was another Imam, I didn't write his by example, but he, there was another Imam, his sister, she said to him, the food is ready, come eat it. And he said, I'm busy, I'm busy, I can't. So pay attention to this. And he sat reading, reading, reading. And she called him again and she said, come eat. And he said, I'm busy. And so after she called him twice, she just came the third time and she fed him the food. And then she took the, the plate back. When he had finished his research, he stood up and he said to her, now bring me the food that you promised to bring me. Bring me the food that you promised. And then she said to him, but I fed you the food. Wallah. I'd already given it to you. Their minds went. Now I'm going to spend some time on one great Imam. I'm going to really go into his life and examples of his. This man is called Yahya ibn Ma'in, rahimahullah. Yahya ibn Ma'in. You will know who Yahya ibn Ma'in is. First of all, let me give you an example of um, how he saw the value of time. Yahya ibn Ma'in, he came to his teacher, Muhammad ibn al-Fadl. Muhammad ibn al-Fadl was a great imam. His memorization was accurate, strong. Yahya ibn Ma'in is the friend of al-imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Yahya ibn Ma'in and Ahmad ibn Hanbal are very close friends. We'll see that later. And Yahya ibn Ma'in is the teacher of who? Al-Imam al-Bukhari. Are we all together? He's who? He's Bukhari's teacher. This great Imam, Yahya ibn Ma'in. Yahya ibn Ma'in, he came to his teacher, Muhammad ibn al-Fadl. And he told him uh, to tell him a hadith. He said, tell me this hadith. 
And the Shaykh said, okay, let me tell you it. And then he said to him, can you tell me it and dictate it from your book that you wrote the hadith in? Because every scholar, they had a book in which they would write the hadith and they would memorize it from there and then they would, then memor then they would read it from memory. He said, can you narrate it from the original source on where you wrote it in? Why would he say that? So he can get accuracy. And so Muhammad al-Fadlin said, okay, I'll do it for you. He stood up. Yahya quickly thought, he grabbed the Shaykh Muhammad ibn Fadl's uh, garment and he dragged him down. He said, first tell me it. First tell me the narration. He said to him, Amlihi alayya fa inni akhafu, I am scared. Alla alqaaka that I may not meet you. Remember, and where was he? Ala babi darihi, the front of his door. They had a porch in front of the door. That's where he was narrating. All he did is go into his house, get the book out, come. It's in front of his door. He said, I am scared that I may not meet you again. Tell me it now. And then bring out the book if you want to. Okay, he told him the hadith from memory. And then he went in and he brought him the book. And he read it from the book again. Let me mention who Yahya ibn Ma'in is. Please take this down. And look at who this great Imam is. Yahya ibn Ma'in, he was born when the year was 158. 158. And he was raised in Baghdad. He wrote, he started to write hadith from the age of 10. He said, from the age of 10 until the age I am in now, I have been writing the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 10. 10. He was writing hadith. What are our 10 year olds doing? We actually consider our 10 year olds to be what? Hey, little baby man, don't worry. You'll get there inshallah. We'll... 10, Yahya ibn Ma'in was writing hadith. Rather, his father, Yahya ibn Ma'in's father, was al kutab. His father was a scriber. His father was a writer. An apple doesn't fall far from a tree. An apple doesn't fall far from a tree. Like father, like son. Yahya's father was a writer for Abdul Malik ibn Malik al Jarrah. He was a writer for him. Yahya ibn Ma'inin's dad left behind for him one million dirham. One million dirham. Dirham is made out of fiddha, silver. One million. He's a millionaire. The dirham is valuable money. I tried to calculate it, but I forgot to finish off the calculation. But one million dirham, his father left it for him. You know what he said? He said, فَأَنْفَقْتُ كُلَّهَا All of that one million dirham, I spent it all in the hadith of the Prophet Every single one of it. Yahya ibn Ma'in, rahimahullah ta'ala. The scholars that took hadith from him was Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Ahmed sat down and used to write hadith from Yahya ibn Ma'in. And Imam al-Bukhari used to write from him. Muslim wrote from him. Abu Dawood, Abbas al duriyu who is called Rawiyatu Madhabihi, the one who spread the Madhab of al ibn Ma'in. Abu Zur'at al-Razi, Abu Hatim al-Razi, Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Darimi, Abu Ya'la al-Musiri, all of these they wrote from him. This is not the point. The point I want to come to is, look what Yahya ibn Ma'in said. He said, I wrote one million hadith with my hand. Yahya ibn Ma'in says, Katabtu alfa alfa hadithin, one million hadith, each one 50 times. Each one I wrote it 50 times. Yahya ibn Ma'in says, He reached a level in dikka, how detailed and how sharp he was, that Imam Ahmed said, Kullu hadith in every hadith. لا يعرفه يحيى بن معين إن يحيى بن معين doesn't know فليس بحديث is not a hadith if يحيى says I don't know this hadith consider it to be fabricated or made up who say this أحمد بن حنبل رحمه الله تعالى 
يحيى بن احمد بن حنبل وان اوتي سيد يحيى بن معين يحيى بن معين رجل خلقه الله this is a man Allah created him for what purpose لهذا الشأن Allah brought يحيى بن معين into this world just to serve the hadith that was his purpose in his dunya يثر كذب الكذابين يحيى will cleanse the hadith from the liars those who will try to lie about the prophet he made it his job he made it his job to say you're a liar the prophet didn't say this rahimahullahu ta'ala to defend the religion now comes the the most powerful part of yahya ibn ma'in's life please ponder here yahya ibn ma'in what did i just say his role was to defend the prophet's hadith when the year was 233 hijriya when the year was 233 Hijriah, Yahya ibn Ma'inin, he made the decision to go to Mecca for Hajj. He said, that year I'm going to go Hajj. And when he went to Hajj, he took the route of Medina. He went through the Miqat of the people of Medina, the Hulayfa. And he took that road to go to Mecca, Yahya ibn Ma'in. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And when he came back from Hajj, he went to what? To Mecca, and then from where he was from Iraq. He, he, he wanted to go through Mecca. When he reached Mecca, an illness striked him. An illness striked him. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And he became sick severely, and he died. He died. When he died, In Medina, for the first time, they brought out the sarir or the, the table that the messenger was washed with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they washed the body of Yahya ibn Ma'in on the same place as the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the people kept saying, when they, his body was being washed, Yahya ibn Ma'inin, كَانَ يَذُبُّ الْكَذِبَ This man used to deflect lies against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And today, he has sat in the place of the Prophet's body when he died. مَنْ عَمِلَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ مَاتَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ بُعْتَ عَلَيْهِ Anyone who spent his life doing something, he will most likely die in that way, wallah. And anyone who dies in a particular way will be resurrected the day of judgment in that way. That's something we all have to remember. What we do in this world for this religion and the sacrifice that we give to this deen will without a shadow of a doubt become inshallah ta'ala the way that we will die. And if we die in that way, we'll be resurrected the day of judgment in that way. We today think about the money that we need to make and the risk that we need to come with. Brothers, your risk and your money is in the hands of Allah. Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا وَيَعْلَمُ مُسْتَقَرْحَ وَمُسْتَوْدَعَا There is no person on this earth except your risk is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِزْقُكُمْ وَمَا تُعَدُونَ Your risk is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. My Shaykh told me, he said to me that there was a man once in Somalia. He owned a shop. He owned a shop. And what he did was, when at night the shop will be closed, the owner who owned the shop, when the workers would leave, he would stay to count how much money was made. And the profit and the loss, he would busy himself with that. So one day, he was in the shop and he was counting the money. And he heard the snoring of a man. Snoring of a man. Snoring heavily. And so he came out and he saw that it was one of his employees sleeping in front of the shop. Snoring in a deep sleep, relaxed. 
So he woke him up. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I've been sleeping here. There's no point in me going home and coming back in the morning and spending the money on my travel. So I sleep here. And I get up for work and I come to work from here. The owner was shocked, baffled. He said, I'm the one who owns this place. I'm the one who gives this man provision, give him money, his monthly bills. I'm the one who gives it to him. And he's less stressed than I am, sleeping, lying down, enjoying himself. I'm here stressed, counting the money. Is it, oh, the calculation doesn't meet up. What happened to this? The difference is, richness is not how much money you have, how much wealth that you have. Or how much is in your bank? Wallahi, richness is ghina nafs if you're rich inside. It's what you have inside and it is what is with you. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, the Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, ma mala adamiyun wi'a an sharran min batnim bihasb ibn adami bihasb ibn adama ukalatun yuqib nasulbah. This stomach of yours, nothing can fill you. There is not a vessel that you fill worse than your stomach. It's the worst place to fill. Then the Prophet said, enough for you to put into your stomach is that which you can straighten your back. All you need to put in your stomach is the amount that you can straighten your back. Because remember when you become hungry, what happens to you? The person carves. That's what happens to you, right? Isn't that what happens? If hunger hits you, the person, it's like get a hunchback. Sir? All you need from this dunya is to straighten your back. The poet, he said, You can remove Hunger with a dry bread. So why are you stressed? Why are you whispering to yourself? Why are you so stressed? If I ate today a dry bread and water and you had a nice meal, both of us are the same. No one knows. We look the same. True or false? So why are you so stressed? Your provision was written for you before you came into existence. The thing that you need to focus on is your time. And the way to benefit from your, from your time. I'm going to now go into... One other story that I didn't mention that I think is worth mentioning before Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, is the great grammarian Ta'lab al-Nahwi, rahimahullah. This one shocked me as well. Ta'lab, and Imam Ta'lab al-Nahwi, rahimahullah, and we spoke about him in the introduction to grammar that we were doing is in, in essentials. You know what the cause of his death was? The cause of his death was, he was reading a book and he fell into a ditch. And he died from it. He had a book in his hand and he was walking. He had a... He had a... He had a book. And he was reading the book. And he was walking and he was walking and he was walking and he fell into a ditch. And that was the cause of his death. The great grammarian. Doesn't want to waste his time. Rahimahullah. Let me go to Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. Rahimahullah. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, he came to his students one day. He came to his students one day. And Abu Ja'far al-Tabari, Abu Ja'far al-Tabari, قال لأصحابه, he said to his students, أتنشطون لتفسير القرآن? He said, are you guys enthusiastic? How would you guys feel if a tafsir of the Quran was written? Ibn Jarir al-Tabari saying this to his students. What do you guys think if I was to write a tafsir? They said to him, Kam yakunu qadru? Kam yakunu qadru? How, how big is it going to be? What's the length of this tafsir book? 
He said, "Thalathuna alf waraqa, thirty thousand pages." That's my plan. What are you guys thinking? Like these guys, they had high aspirations. Thirty thousand, and then they said to him, "Hada mimma tafna al-amaru qabla tamami." Before it can be completed, people's lives will go. Meaning, if you wrote that, people won't even be able to finish reading it. They will die before they can read it. فَاخْتَصَرَهُ He summarized it. فِي ثَلَاثَةِ آلَافٍ وَرَقَةٍ To 3,000 pages. And his tafsir today is considered to be the biggest tafsir book. Tafsir of Jalil al-Tabari. Or one of the biggest tafsir books. It's about 12 or 13 volumes. That's less. He, he, now he, how many? He did it 3,000 pages, right? How much was his plan in the beginning? 30,000. He then said to his students, okay. Okay, maybe I'll ask you guys another question. I'm going to write history. Min Adam, from the time of Nabilah Adam, Ila waqtina hada till this time. Hey, what do you guys think? They said, Kam Qadru. How big is it going to be? How lengthy is it going to be? He said, 30,000. And then they said to him the same thing that they said. Before anyone can finish it, people's lives will come to an end. And then he summarized it into 3,000 3, pages. Again, it's one of the biggest history books. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, from the time of Nabiullah Adam to the time that he lived, he wrote it. Rahimahullahu rahmatan wasi'ah. It was said that every day Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, without exception, without no excuses, he authored 40 pages every day. 40 pages every day. Yaktubu kulla yawmin arba'ina waraqa ta'leefan. Remember, writing 40 pages means you have to have a draft. You have to have a draft. You have to know what to take out. What to... Each day he came out with a final edition of 40 pages daily. Rahimahullahu rahmatan wasi'ah. These are our scholars. I want to say to you all, إِن لَمْ تَكُونُوا مِثْلَهُمْ فَتَشَبَّهُوا If you can't be like them, then try to imitate them. Imitating the righteous people is an honor. Do something. Benefit from your life. Al Hakim al Shahid. Rahimahullah. It was said he would not. He will not talk to the guests that would come to him. And his visitors. Due to the preoccupation. And that he was busy with. Writing. Because he was busy with writing, if guests came to him, he wouldn't talk to them. And if he did, he would pass them inks and he would give them pens to sharpen for him. And he would say, sharpen this for me, organize this for me. That's what he would do to them. So he could benefit from his time. And that's the reality. Many people will come to you when you're trying to benefit from your time and they will try to busy you from it. So he would make even the people who visited him get reward. Now we're going to go into the second part and the second segment of our lecture. Now this is going to be the longest and the most detailed one inshallah ta'ala. The reason I say this is going to be the longest and the most detailed one is because a lot of us will already agree on all of that which I mentioned, sah? The importance of time, the value of time, and how the Qur'an and the Sunnah honor time and value time. But the overwhelming majority of questions that I get is how can we benefit from our time? Or what can we do to benefit from our time? And so inshaAllah ta'ala, I'm going to do it, inshallah ta'ala, with these three slides, which will take three to four hours, inshallah ta'ala. So, how to organize your daily routine? 
How does a believer organize his daily routine? There are three points that I've written. Each one there's going to come out so much points out, out of it. But I'm going to start with the third one. And I'm going to make that the first one. If you want to benefit from your time and you want to bring the best out of it, you have to eliminate and get rid of gadgets that steal your time. A lot of people, and I say eliminate it. If it's going to take away from your time, eliminate it. If you have the discipline to use your gadgets accordingly, then inshallah ta'ala, use it in that which will benefit you in and don't waste your time if it's not going to help you. <clears throat> this point I tend to find a lot of people don't discuss when it comes to the concept of benefiting from your time. A parent will come to me and he will say to me, my child, I have bought him a Quran teacher. I have exerted every effort in my child. And I say to them, I do not question. I don't doubt what you're saying. But what other things are in the house? Oh yeah, he's got a game. Okay, know that. Uh, yeah, next. These things, brothers and sisters, will work against you. They will distract you. And they will take away from anything we're going to say today. Are we all together? One of the statements that my sheikh said and it, it sticks with me greatly is if these gadgets were of so much value, Allah would have given it to the Prophet to aid him to spread Islam. True? Allah would have said to Muhammad, this is it, mobile phone. Call the companions. Converse with them. Don't waste time sending a horse and a camp. No. But it's Allah didn't want that, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, these gadgets, to an extent, have brought out laziness from many people. If you want to find a hadith, what do you do? Google it up. Google it up is now a term in the dictionary. You just look it up quickly. The hadith that you got that fast, are you going to remember it? Is it going to stick with your head? But imagine a hadith that you traveled months and you got to your destination and you found that the imam that you went to, this is his janazah, and they said to you, lead the janazah. And then that hadith, when you find another imam who's narrating it, are you going to forget it? No. So anything that comes easy, generally goes out easily. So brothers, technology, and social media has sucked our time. It's taken it. And if every one of you here right now has a mobile phone, and you got an iPhone, iPhone will tell you how long you spent on WhatsApp. It will tell you how long you spent on the Safari, the internet. It will tell you how long you spent on Instagram, Facebook, what are, what are, what are the, all of them, it will tell you exactly. And then it will tell you how long you spent on the Quran app. So, how many percentage you spent on the Quran app? It will show you all. One sheikh said, if the ummah were to hold on to the Quran, just the way that they hold on to their mobile phones, it would have been an honored nation. True or false? When your phone's battery is low, how do you feel? You fly, oh, the qiyamah is happening, ya Allah. You find the person who generally never used to ask for favors, starts asking for favors. Do you have a charger, brother? Do you have a socket? I've seen people who carry around their charger. Sah? People carry their charger with them, in their bags, in their pockets. They have their charger in case the, ba the battery phone goes off because they can't stay uh, away from it. Another benefit that I came across was it was better when the phones had wires stuck to the wall. Now, 
we've become the wires stuck to the phone. It's the reality. So, if you want to benefit from your time, social media, gadgets, phones, all these distractions, learn to push them to the side and stay away from them. Prevention is better than cure. To prevent takes precedence over thinking about bringing good. You want to teach your children Quran? First of all, get rid of all of the problems, all of the things that can distract them. Television, get rid of them. Get rid of all of this. Once you do, you're now free to say, I'm going to set myself all of this. And you will benefit. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sorry, the companions, they said, it was narrated from some of the Sahabas, that they said, Akbaru ama a'adhamu silahi iblis at-tasawwuf. The biggest weapon of iblis is procrastination. The biggest. At-tasweef, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Watch. I will do this tomorrow. That's the biggest weapon Iblis has against the children of Adam. And tomorrow, does it ever come? No, it doesn't. Next day is tomorrow again. And then another day is tomorrow. And tomorrow just keeps... It's a mirage. It never comes. Tomorrow never comes. And so the person keeps pushing the deadline and whatever he wants to do. Gadgets. Eliminate it. Get rid of it. Another point I want to mention before I go into the other points is مَا مَضَى فَاتَ وَالْمُؤَمَّلُ غَيْبٌ وَلَكَ السَّاعَةُ الَّتِي أَنْتَ فِيهَا What has happened? مَا مَضَى فَات Whatever has happened in the past, brothers, it's gone. Let's not cry over spilt milk. It's gone. وَالْمُؤَمَّلُ غَيْبٌ And as for the future that you're discussing and you're saying, yeah, I'm going to do that in the future, don't worry. Uh, sorry, don't, dis- don't think about it too much. That's the future. Allah Alam, it's not in your hand. وَلَكَ السَّاعَةُ الَّتِي أَنْتَ فِيهَا the only thing that you possess is the time that you're in. The past is gone. The future is not in your hands. Allah alam, if you're going to reach that time that you think you are, the thing that we can talk about is what? The time that you're in. Okay? Point, inshallah ta'ala. Now I'm going to go into the, my main point, inshallah ta'ala. Set goals. If you want to benefit, you have to be smart. If you want to benefit, what do you have to be? What do you have to be? You have to be smart. S stands for something, M stands for something, A stands for something, R stands for something, and the T stands for something. Write it down. The A stands for, you have to be specific. If you want to benefit from your time, you have to be specific. Each one we're going to discuss in great details. It's called a smart goal. Anything you want to achieve, you have to be smart about it. It's called a smart goal. The first one is you have to be specific. The M stands for, it has to be measurable, meaningful, whatever, they, whatever, which, whatever one you take. Some say it's measurable, some say it's meaningful, some say it's motivating. It's all different riwayat, different narrations. Number, th- number A, what is it? And there's another achievable and there's another riwayah, attainable. Achievable or attainable. Each one we're going to discuss in details inshallah ta'ala. The A is achievable, the R is relevant, different narration says, reasonable. Realistic, resourced, all of them. Aqwal, riwayat. And last but not least, T, which is time based, time bound, time limited, time cost limited. Those five is the asal of time benefiting. If you want to truly attain your goal in something, you have to do these ones, these points. Now, but let's start with the first one, inshallah ta'ala. The first one is, be specific. Your goal should be clear. If you want to achieve something, the goal has to be very clear. I 
what a lot of people are like, I, uh, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to memorize the Quran. That's not specific. No, no, no. You have to be very specific when you say you want to memorize the Quran. What do you mean? I'm going to memorize this much daily. That's specific. In three months, I'm going to have to finish this specific. So the person has to, should be clear and specific. Or you will not be able to focus on what you do. And a lot of people, when it comes to goals, they mention general points and never detailed issues. Are we all together? Whatever you're trying to attain and you're trying to achieve, it has to be very, very specific. Narrow it down. What's the thing that you want to do? How should you be specific? Write this down. This is generally something you don't find even in the academic world. Is define what you're trying to do. Define it. Give it a definition. Arifu. What does it mean to you? Are we all together? Somebody says, I want to be a student of knowledge. Okay, define it. What's a student of knowledge to you? He might say, a student of knowledge to me is not to memorize the Quran. Maybe that's his definition of student. Define it. Write it. Are we all together? When you define it, second is, write the, out, the benefits in this. It's more specific. What do I gain from doing this? What do I accomplish? Thamaratuhu. The fa'idah that you get from this. You need to write the fa'idah, the benefits that are in there for you. Number three is you have to write the Allah. You have to write the goal, the ghaya, the objective. What is the goal? What is this goal important? Why is this goal important? What's the reason why it makes it important? Also, you have to ask who is involved? Am I alone in this task? Am I going to be memorizing the Quran by myself? Or do I need a teacher? Okay, there's someone else I have to depend on. To be very specific. The reason is because your efforts can become weakened if you know other people you have to depend on. So you have to ask yourself who's involved? Who's the Sheikh that's going to teach me the Quran? Okay, is he a reliable person? Is he time effective? Is he prompt with his time? Are we all together brothers? You have to understand the scholars of hadith, what would they do? Why would they try to lessen the chain of narration? What was the reason why they... Because the longer the chain became, the chances of it being incorrect. So they wanted to get rid of... So you, when it comes to doing a task, the more you can lessen the people involved, the higher of you being able to achieve what you're looking for. Remember that. Less people are involved. You're alone, very good. It's yourself to complain to if you want to. Where is it located? Where is it going to take place? For example, I always ask myself, if I want to read this book, am I going to read it in my house? Am I going to read it in a library? And some books I read in a library and some I read in my house. There's a reason why I change it. Okay? Where is it located? If it's business and dunya, all of these you can answer it in dunya. I, I don't look at a dunya perspective. I look at it from what angle? Seeking Islamic? Islamic knowledge. And attaining my goal in seeking knowledge. What resources do I need? This is me being specific. What resources do I need? Do I have to have books in my library before I start researching now? Do I need a laptop? Is the laptop going to distract me once I get it? Because a lot of the time, when people open their gadgets and they try to research from their gadgets, they tend to find what? That they go off. Doesn't that happen to some of you guys? Well, I don't even like using Aslan. I'm, I'm like you guys. Of course it's going to take my distraction. So what I do is I try to avoid that. I buy hard copies of whatever I'm using. I know myself. But in insanu ala nafsihi, Everyone knows himself. Are we all together? And one of the things I want to mention here is, brothers, Allah Taala He favors people differently. Not everybody is the same. 
the imams that you see in Islam, some of them were masters in one field and they were weak in what? In other fields. And Imam Abu Hanifa was an imam in what? In fiqh. Ho, ho, ho. And Imam Abu Hanifa was an imam in fiqh and he was weak in hadith. Are we all together brothers? This concept of I have to be a master of all is important. You, you may not necessarily be that. Okay? You may not necessarily be that. So you have to understand I'm going to do what I am best at. What did they say? Jack of all trades, a master of none. صح? So the person has to be what? He has to make sure um, what resources he needs. What books I need. A lot of people, they don't have the, the required, the basic requirements before they even go forward. And what are, what are the resources that I'm talking about here? If you want to memorize the Quran, one of the resources is that you have to make sure you know the alphabets. Because the Quran, when the teacher teaches you the Quran, and he makes you memorize the Quran, you would have to go home and what? Revise yourself. So you have to be able to open the Mus'haf and read it yourself. Am I making sense here? So you have to have basic knowledge of the alphabets. All of this is being you being specific. This is all of you being specific. So the five, the five W's. Remember these five W's. This is you being specific. Number one, what? What do I want to accomplish? The five W's. Two, why is this goal vital and important? And you know the long poetry in the Mabadi Akulla Fanin Ashara, Al Haddu al Mawdu Uthum Matamra, Wanisbatum al Fadru al Wadr, Wanismunistim Dadu Hukmu Sharia, Masailum al Badu Bil Badik Tafa, Wamandar al Jamia has a Sharafa. I always look at those five, which is what we're going to look at now. Why is this goal important? Three, who is involved? Who am I going to have to do this task with? Am I alone? If it's a business, Okay, do I need a website designer? Okay, somebody else is involved. It's a website designer. I need to find the right website designer. Are we all together? I need to find a, a, uh, a person who could update information on my social media. So, okay, that's another person involved. So you need to find out who you're working with, who's involved. The fourth W is where is it located? And this where is it located sometimes is... Another question I ask myself, if it's knowledge that I have to memorize or if it's knowledge that I have to understand. Where is it located in my body? Is it the hived part of my mind or is it the understanding part of my brain? All these are questions I need to ask myself. This book I'm reading, what is the purpose behind it? Am I trying to memorize it or am I trying to understand it? Farq bain hada wa dak. Because the whole reading changes when I want to memorize and when I want to read. What resources am I in need of? Which is the fifth, um, which is the fifth W. What resources are involved? What other resources do I need? Me personally, my resources is I have to have a whiteboard in order to re memorize things. Because I write everything on my whiteboard. And I like to see it all day so I can memorize it. All day when I wake up, as soon as I wake up, the whiteboard is right next to my bed uh, where I sleep. And so I have to see it on the whiteboard. I have to keep hitting my eyes. It's my way of memorizing. If I can't, then I like to stick papers on the wall. Are we all together? If I don't have a whiteboard, that's my resource. Are we all together? Also, my resource is I have to record whatever I'm memorizing on my phone. So I sit down and I record it. And then guess what I do? Whenever I go in taxis and I, or I happen to drive, what do I do? I plug my headphones into my phone and I keep listening to it. And I bring out a written, handwritten of whatever segment of a hadith or, an, or a poetry that I want to memorize. I write it with my hand and I listen to it in the taxi. And if the taxi driver tries to talk to me a lot, I give him the sign that I'm busy. I tell him, brother, I'm very busy. 
So I memorize, I, I do that. So my resources are recording on my phone. So I have to have a recorder. I have to have a whiteboard. I have to have a paper. I have to have a pen. Wahakada. Resources, very important. That's what makes you now specify what you're doing. If you don't do those five W's, you're just talking and you're not going to get anywhere what you're trying to do. You are what? You're just saying, it's just kalam, and it won't get anywhere. So what's the first one that I say? What is the first one? What? So what is it? What do? What do I want to? What do I want to accomplish? Every single thing that you're doing, you can answer that question. If you don't have an answer for that, then you're not specific, or you're most likely not going to achieve something because you don't even know what you're going to accomplish from this. Second one is what? Why? Why is this goal important? Why do you find it very important? If you don't have an answer for that, generally you're not going to go forward with it. Generally. Okay? Third one is? Who is involved? Remember the people that are involved with you are your companions. And that's where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Al Mar'u ala dini khalili the person is the what? The religion of his companion. Let one of you make sure who they take as a companion. Your companion who is involved with you in this task will either make you flow and reach your goal or he can destroy you. He can make you and destroy you. صح? What is our aim in life? We want to go to Jannah, right? You generally need a what? Someone to work with you to get to that goal. I want you to ponder here. Is there anyone greater than Nabi Muhammad? No one, right? The Prophet said, was he not aided with the message of Islam? Was he not aided by Allah with everything? Allah was helping him with whatever he needed. Even then Allah Taala told him to have companions. He said, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُ بِالْغَدَأَةِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَةً Muhammad, be patient with the ones who call unto their Lord day and night, they supplicate to their Lord. Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, these noble people, and Ali, these noble people. So it's important if, if you're doing something, you generally try to find someone like minded who can encourage you. It really does help. If you're memorizing something, somebody to compete with, to say, hey, how much you've memorized? Ah, subhanAllah, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you, I'm passing you. That is very good. Compete with one another in good. And personally, two things have always helped me, me personally. Reading the biography of the scholars and the, the, what I just read now, it encourages me. It makes me get up and say, these scholars were born nine months, just like I was born nine months. How did they get to where they got to? And I couldn't. And it gets me energetic and enthusiastic and constituous and I, and I focus on my goal. And the second thing that helps me is to see somebody who's actually progressing in life and achieving something in the deen. When I look at that person, I become very eager to be like him or even pass him. The Prophet said, لا حسد إلا فتنتين. There is no jealousy except in two. رجل آتاه الله علما A man who Allah gave him knowledge and he's teaching the people. ورجل آتاه الله مالا فسلطه على هلكته. Or a man Allah gave him wealth and he's spending that money in the deen of Allah Azza wa Those two people, they are deserving to be jealous of. Without hoping that Allah destroys them, but you want to get what they got, right? That's very important. It will help you. Where is it located? Location plays a role when it comes to achievement. Are we all together? Some people try to learn the religion, or they even try to do their business program, business idea, and in the middle of the living room with their children around. He wants to memorize a hadith, or he wants to memorize an ay ayah, or he wants to read, even if it's dunya stuff. But where do you want to read it? Where is he trying to read? He's trying to read it in the living room where the children are jumping up on the, and daddy grabbing his beard. And you're most likely not going to get what you're looking for in that place. You want to choose the right location. Brothers, 
Make sure you say to the wife, I have to go to the library. I need to go revise. If the wife wants to study, the husband should help her and say, look, I'll look after the kids, go and do your studying. For this moment, don't worry, I'll take that. Because she won't be able to do it in that kind of environment. Location is very important. And where you try to memorize, are you with me? Some of the books that I read and I benefited from helped me a lot in where I read them in. Like the Kitab Sayyid al-Khatir by Ibn al-Jawzi, I read it in the countryside, in the UK. In the greenery, I went, ow, and I drove for hours, ow, ow, hours. And I sat in those greenery, and wahi was, took my little picnic, sandwich, tuna, sweet corn, my thermos, salahatan, and I read Sayyid al-Khatir, a book that really is heart softening. I still remember the things I read, and the greenery that I saw. Very helpful. It really helps you. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, maybe another seminar should be made about um, how to read. Another seminar would be good of how to read. We'll leave that for there, inshallah ta'ala. Which resources, with the fifth one, right? Which resources do you need? Make sure you get the right resources that you need. Let's go to the next uh, one after the specific, what is it? Measure. Measure, it's important to measure your goals. You track your progress. You have a way to track your progress and stay motivated. Two points I just mentioned. What did I just say? Track your, your progress and two things you need in this place. Track your progress and motivate yourself. So everybody has a way to track their progress. Are we all together? Can anyone here maybe volunteer and tell us how they track their progress so we can share ideas as well? Ah, yeah, how do you do it? Uh, if someone's trying to lose weight, uh -huh. they're going to the gym. Okay. Uh, they can measure uh, their muscle mass uh, or their fat percentage every week or so. Every week or so. So you go on a treadmill machine, so you go on the weighing machine or something? Yeah. Okay, so anything else in terms of business, dunya, deen? How do you measure your, your progress? How do you look at your progress? Or you track your progress? How are you, Fadl? A checklist, yeah. very important. Checklist is very good. That you tick off what you've done is very important. Uh, yeah. Generally when we read Quran and uh -huh. Quran, so uh -huh. we track like each salah we you know recite five uh, pages or something and then keep a track of that so that we continue and finish it. Again a checklist, a track holding a checklist. Any we break down the goal in uh, small parts and then we see like uh, uh, are we able to complete the weekly targets or not. So that's a kind of a motivation also. Okay, if we have completed in the week what we have assigned after mm -hmm. Okay. Weekly progress, tracking it down based on weekly, true, motivating. One of the things I just said right now is tracking your progress is a form of motivation. If you know I have accomplished this, it makes you really want to do more. Are we all together? Now, I want to stop here and I really want to say something that really many people bring up, which is if you're tracking your progress, don't look at what you haven't done, look at what you have done. Because if you look at the Mus'haf like this and you say, whoa, I just memorized this much. SubhanAllah, I've got this much left. <laughs> it's going to take away the motivation. Don't look at that. Just look at what you've memorized. And be grateful. Also, what motivates and it really helps is, as I said, two things. I, re I, and I always make these two things. Reading stories of those who have preceded you. Who've done it. The imams of the sunnah. These great scholars that I just mentioned. For me, it's very motivating. Every week, I have to read one or two stories of these great imams. Because you have to keep up your momentum. I like to do that. And also... 
I like to call a few people who I know that are like-minded. Well, I can just kind of discuss things with them and see how, yeah, have they progressed in life and kind of test them. Hey, yeah, oh, have you memorized this much? No, you haven't, in it. Well, I have. Shame on you. No. Motivation. This is very, it, it, very, it, it really helps. The poet, he said, وَمَنْ تَكُنِ الْعِلْيَا هِمَّةَ نَفْسِهِ فَكُلُّ الَّذِي يَلْقَى فِيهِ محببه. Anyone whose aspiration is high, who has high aspiration, every pain that they endure on the way, they will find it as what? Joy. You will enjoy it. Well, Idarika, the scholars, they used to say, may Allah have mercy on the body of a person who has high aspiration. He's going to destroy the body. He's going to drag his body into the, the mud. He's going to drag this body through the hardest. He's going to put it through everything because his mind is on another level and he wants the body to keep up with it. Motivation is very important. You need to motivate yourself all the time. And you have to assess. You have to assess yourself based on that. These are the three questions that you need to ask yourself if you want to measure your, track your progress. These are the three questions that you ask yourself. Questions are very important, brothers and sisters. Asking yourself a question, it, came, it comes from Islam. What did Umar say? Account yourself before you are accounted. And scale yourself before you are scaled the day of judgment. The believer is always asking himself a question. صح? When Jibreel came to the Messenger, والسلام, what did Jibreel do to teach us about Islam? How did he teach us about Islam? Question and answers. He didn't just come Jibreel and preach every point. Jibreel and the Prophet taught Islam in what way? He asked, he answered. He asked, he answered. Things come out from that. So the first question you ask yourself is how much? How much have I accomplished? How much have I achieved? How much have I gained? How many? And how many generally is used for uh, dunya, money, and etc. The third question is a question I want to ask you all. How will you know what you accomplished? Which is the third question. How will I know what I accomplished? How does one know that they accomplished something? How do you know you've attained something and you've met your required need? How would you know that? Huh? So how would you know that you've met your progress? That you've... you've the checklist. Some people might say, you know, some people generally like to be nice to themselves and they will just tick the box when it's half-baked effort or a half-baked work. How can you truly determine if you've accomplished your goal? And if it goes back to you just assessing yourself, then a lot of us are very nice to one ourselves, right? Huh? Do, do you guys see the point I'm trying to bring here? Put your hand up if you agree with my point. That if you're the only one who's judging himself, then you generally sometimes might just tick it and say, SubhanAllah. I don't want to depress myself or stress myself out, just let's take it. Do you agree? You can't be the you can't be the judge and the jury. So do you agree? So how can you determine that you've accomplished your goal? How do you know you've you've attained what you wanted? Hmm? Someone else? Somebody who's more got more knowledge than you, something? So it brings us back to the concept of companionship. Are we all together? It brings us back to that point. You have to have a... If it's the religion, what do you have to have? A teacher. You have to have a what? For example, I'll give you an example of my situation. I read a book. And when I read books, this is what I do. Every book I read... And I'll be speaking about how to read a book, inshallah ta'ala, another session, or another seminar. I have to summarize that book. If it's three volumes, two volumes, I have to make it into one volume. If it's already one volume, then I have to make it half a volume. 
summarize the book. When I summarize the book, I have to summarize it in a way where the book does not become what? I don't get rid of vital information. I only get rid of what the author repeated. Second thing I need to do to that book is I have to write the content page again. The content page comes from me. So when I need to reference that book, I can quickly reference it because I wrote the content page. Are we all together? I'll leave that for another time of how to read a book. Now, I've read the book. I summarized the book. I've written a content page. Based on me, what did I just, what am I going to do? I'm going to take the, take the accomplishment. But how do I really know I've accomplished what I wanted? What about if I've misunderstood the whole book? It can that not be the case? So that's where a higher authority is vital all the time. So I call the shuyukh, so I call a sheikh, she and I say, Sheikh, I've read this book, and uh, can I just have a discussion with you regarding the book? Yeah, faddal. And he gives me what he, well, I, I give him what I think, and he tells me if he agrees with my observation and if he doesn't. Are we all together, brothers? Now, this is very important. Many people, when they want to measure their task and their progress, they say they only take it from three people, me, myself, and I. Are we all together? And so that's it. I've progressed. I've done my task. Alhamdulillah. Next, 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 next. But really when someone sits with you, they're like, yeah, you yeah, haven't. Yeah. You didn't do it. Another point I want to give you. If a person takes a qualification, does that mean that they've progressed? Just because you've graduated from an institution. Because one of the tasks that inshallah ta'ala we're going to mention when we talk about the, the other ones is... A person might graduate from a prestigious university. That doesn't just, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've attained what you went into that institution for. And then progressing, uh, sorry, looking at your progression, you need a higher authority to determine you personally. Very important. A brother will say, yeah, I need to, I need to become an engineer, so I'm going to get a qualification. Five years he's out, he comes out. And then he gets the certificate for it. But then before they take him for the civil engineering job, they say, we're going to take a test from you. And bam, he fails the test. Five years of hard work. He thinks he progressed. But what did he do? He's in a lot of trouble. So it's important that you get someone to look at your hard work. What's the three that I mentioned? How much? How much? And the second one was? How many? And the third one was? How will I know when I? When, it is, when it's accomplished. How would I know? Third one, inshallah ta'ala. Achievable. Your goal also needs to be realistic and attainable to be successful. Your goal, it also needs to be realistic and it has to be attainable if you want to be successful in what you're trying to achieve. Pay attention to this. A person says, in, in one month I want to finish the whole entire Quran. I don't want to... Can it be done? Yeah, it's possible. Somebody can do it out there, but is that realistic? Is that realistic? If you to finish the whole entire Quran in one month? I mean, there's some people who have done it. If you don't give yourself a realistic measurement and something that is realistic and that it's attainable, if you don't do that, what happens? You become depressed, stressed, and heartbroken if you don't achieve it. Achievable. That was the point that we were on. Your goals need to be realistic and attainable to be successful. In other words, it should stretch your abilities but still remain possible. That's very important. It should stretch your ability but it has to be possible. 
if it makes you tired and exhausted and you become no, that's good Stress, put a lot of hard work on yourself stretch your abilities Jameel, that's what, that's what it should be but it has to be possible and a lot of people they conflate these two they think if you stretch your ability and it being possible is one and the other and that's not the case sometimes it's not going to happen what you're trying to achieve so you have to be very realistic some people this is what causes them stress they become very stressful even depression everyone else is better than I am I can't achieve this because at the beginning you did not set yourself a realistic goal and it was not achievable does that make sense? and I'm going to expand on that later this mountain that you see is from pebbles and the English they have a saying Rome was not built in it wasn't built in one day so in order to achieve what you're trying to achieve it's khutwat it's steps shaytan look at this he doesn't misguide the person one time and throw them off even he applies it here he has he's got realistic measures he sniffs the person's characteristics if he realizes that you're a hard working person shaytan will go he will push it to extremism and he will make you go overboard and if he sniffs from you that you're relaxed easy you know life is you know just relax take it easy tomorrow's gonna come if he sniffs that from you he will throw you into negligence and and Imam al he said and he doesn't care which of those two he achieves whether he throws you into extreme exaggeration or extreme negligence he doesn't care as long as he takes you away from that middle path what did Allah say shaytan shaytan has steps gradual he does it bit by bit shaytan sets himself a realistic goal and he achieves it very well he's mastered he's mastered us and why haven't we mastered him why haven't we studied Iblis and why don't we know him? The point I want to come back to is you as a person have to give yourself a realistic measure. Now pay attention. How can you give yourself a realistic and achievable, attainable goal? Number one, you have to know yourself. That's important. You have to study yourself know who you are be honest with yourself don't lie to yourself and say yeah i'm very i'm, I'm good with my timing and whatnot be honest with yourself so because you know yourself then you will set yourself a realistic goal because you know yourself and you've been honest to yourself so if you know that you're not a good memorizer and you're a slow memorizer and you see another brother and you say how long is it going to take you to memorize? And he goes, two, two days. And you're like, yeah, okay, I'll do two days as well. <laughs> no, be real with yourself. This man, Allah gifted him. This is a blessing from Allah. Allah gives it to whoever he wills. And who said it's a race? Who said it's a race? It is not a race. You're not racing with anyone. The issue isn't who gets to the finish line first. Is who is on that path to the finish line. That's what matters. Are we all together? So realistic measure, realistic goals. If it happens that you stretch yourself or you stretch your ability, no problem. But it has to be something that can happen, something that can occur. Or else, do you know what you do? You give up and you turn away from it. And you don't want to do it ever again. You're like, you know what? I tried and it wasn't for me. I'm going to leave. And that happens to a lot of people who are seeking knowledge. They come and they see, woo, this isn't, woo, this is big. Okay, uh, this is not for me. 
I'm not gonna do this, I'm gonna go for something else. So, if you don't wanna lose your aspiration, make sure you do realistic. But the scholars, they used to say, Imam Zuhri, he said, Man ilma jumlatan fatatu jumla. Anyone who tries to take knowledge all at once, it leaves him all at once. So even if you do achieve it, and you do attain it, it's most likely going to go out of your hands quickly. This gradual is amazing, it's powerful. Now remember this, an achievable goal must answer two questions. Two, if you can answer these two questions, then it's achievable. The first one is, how can I accomplish this goal? If you can answer that question, it's achievable, it's attainable. How can I accomplish this goal? If you can answer that question, then mashallah, you have an idea of achieving it. And it's something attainable. If you don't know how, it's impossible to do it then, for you. Number two, how realistic is the goal? Based on other constraints and other issues in my life. I'm a mother of three kids. I'm a mother of two kids. I'm a mother of four kids. I'm a father who has to work for four or five kids. I have a low financial budget, struggling to make ends meet. How much time can I really exert coming to seek knowledge or memorize? Be realistic with yourself. Look at your buruf. Look at the context of your life and how you are. It's very important. Don't be absent from all of that. One of the things I learned in my life is one of the greatest characteristics of a person who wants to achieve something, who wants to gain something is one thing does not get in the way of the other. Nothing should get in the way of the other. Each thing should be consistent and continuous. It should be going and your retreat, everything is flowing. If one thing gets in the way of the other, then that means it's not realistic. Are we all together? You either have to get, stop one of the things that you're doing, or you have to reduce the amount in order, in order for it to be balanced, very vital. Reduce it. Reduce it again. Reduce it again. Like for example, if you want to memorize the Quran, why do you have to set yourself a one year goal? Why do you have to set yourself a two year goal? Why do you make it four? Five. Don't worry. Take your time. You see, if you say to your Sheikh, Sheikh, I want to learn the Quran, I'm going to do one ayah a day. One ayah a day. Some of you might look at that and say, that's really little. But you don't do that now. And so this is the problem that we have, and it's common amongst the people. They either want to do a lot, or it's nothing. Do you agree? And what did our Prophet tell us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ وَإِنْ قَلَّ The action that is most beloved to Allah is what? That which is consistent, even if it's, even if it's little. It's consistency that Allah loves subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's consistency. And so, so it's very important that you make sure that you take something realistic and that's generally what you can carry on. You can carry on. And you'll be able to get somewhere with it. Point number four. Point number four which is relevant, right? Is it number four? Yeah? We did three, right? We did specific, we did measure, and we did achievable, right? Right now. So it's the fourth one, Rele relevant, right? Relevant. Relevance is very important. If you want to achieve your goal, for it to be relevant. This is to ensure that this matter means something to you. i give an example. I am 
a person who is into, for example, business. And I'm a businessman. What do I need to know? I need to know the ahkam related to what? The rulings related to business. Because it's relevant to my life. Right now I'm a businessman. I'm into business. And I have to study because it's relevant to what I'm doing. Umar ta'ala anhu, he said, let him not come close to our market, the one who doesn't know the ahkam of buyur. Don't come close to the market. Don't try to do business. Don't try to train, trade. If you don't know the prohibited elements in Islamic finance. If you don't know it, don't come to the market. Don't be a businessman. Don't trade. Don't sell. Don't buy. Why? Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, وَقَعَ فِي الْرِبَى شَاءَ أَمْ أَبَى he will fall into riba whether he likes it or not. Unintentionally, you didn't know what you're doing. What you're doing right now is called what? It's called a riba. And so you're trading riba unintentionally. You don't know it. But what brought you to this problem? Al jahl. So, if you now look at business and you study ahkam, rulings regarding business. It's relevant to you, right? Is it not? It is relevant to you. Then studying something else that's not relevant to your life at that moment. So, some of the ways to benefit is to start something or to achieve something, start with what is relevant to you. A lot of Muslims, they talk about things that are not, that are not relevant to them. That doesn't concern them, that doesn't benefit them. And so because of that they burn out and they don't carry on practicing the religion because they were talking about and they were indulging into what? That which doesn't benefit them. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Min husnil Islam al mar The excellence of a person's Islam is that he concerns himself with that which is relevant to him. That which concerns you. That which is important to you, you learn that. Tahara, do you need that? Of course you do. Salah, do you need to know it? Of course you do. Sawm, do you need to know that? Yes, you do. Hajj, naam. zakat, yes. Majority of you here knew, need all of that. That's called ibadat. In the chapter of fiqh, ibadat. Every one of you has to know that. When you study that, which you then go home and you apply straight away, you'll be able to achieve that goal. Whereas if it's what? If it's Arabic grammar, you'll be like, yeah, when am I going to need to know? When am I going to apply this in my day-to-day -day life? It may not be something you do because it's not, it's not relevant to your life right now. Sahih? You don't, you don't use that at work or you don't use that. So relevant is very important. And you become, it increases your motivation for you wanting to pursue this even more and more. Because you went work, and you're like, SubhanAllah, I actually knew a matter in my work, and I told my colleagues about it. And the person's happy. I've seen people who call me and say, you know that course that you did, SubhanAllah, I've shared my notes with all the people at work, and they are using it, and etc. So, because he found relevance in it. It was something that he can execute, and he can do, Straight away. So, anything in the religion that you're learning, try to take out the first thing that you do after you look at the obligatory sciences, start with what is relevant to you. What concerns you? What do you need? The scholars, they used to call that ilmul hal, the knowledge of the now. What do you need now? And forget what the future holds, Allah Alam. Because there are some knowledges, and some Islamic sciences, that you, it's not for you to learn at this moment of your life. Leave it to the people of knowledge, that's their field of uh, dealing, and that's what they have to do. So, anything you want to see, if it's relevant to you, it has to answer the following questions. 
a relevant goal can answer yes to these questions. It has to be yes. Number one, does this seem worthwhile? Does this seem worthwhile? If I say yes, it seems relevant. Again, when we say does it seem worthwhile, some issues you don't determine that. You can't say, is it worthwhile for me to learn tahara or for me to learn salah? No, 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 it is worthwhile. Of course it is. Are we all together? It's not always what you say that's worthwhile for me to learn. But this does apply, of course, in your dunya. Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. You know your worldly affairs. You look at what's re- what you're relevant, what you're good at. I want to help some students who are now going to apply for university this year. And it happens to a lot of kids in university. They go to university and they take a science that they didn't even like. They didn't even find it relevant in their life. And they do it. And they're not asked, they don't, it's not something they feel connected to. And so they don't do it with aspiration. Are we all together? I did linguistics in university. I hated every minute of university class. I hated the teacher and the class and the walls and everything. I would walk in and... Do I want to share this? <laughs> I'd, bring my, I'd bring my Islamic books in the back and I'd read it. And Salah, I would. I would bring my Islamic books, Ibn Qayyim, Ibn Taymi in the back. I'd sit and I'd take notes. And whenever I heard the teacher say something very important, I'd call my attention, if it did. I'd quickly take a note, but I would fully, fully rely on the PowerPoint presentation that they would put on the uh, Moodle. No himma, no aspiration. You see, but if I took a science that I was ambitious about, I would walk into that class at the front line, put my finger up. I would, but it wasn't. I just wanted to get the degree, halas. And how much did I get for the exam? And so, the truth is, Many of you have to look into this. What you're taking in university, the degree that you want to pursue, the path that you want to set yourself, it has to be relevant to you. And I'll tell you something. Wallahi, I'll be honest with you. If, you're, if you learn medicine, this might upset some parents, but trust me, I believe in this with unwavering conviction. If the child pursues okay, learning medicine because he was forced to do it, and he does it half-heartedly, he may do a better job if he was to study art with conviction, love and passion. Just, just example. Hafiqa. Are you with me? It's what you have. You do a better job. You do a better job. If you're going to be a milkman, be the best milkman out there. Sah. It's whatever the person finds relevance in. The way they do it. And if you look at Allah Azza wa Jalla, the way He created the creation, He made everybody different. SubhanAllah, people just love different things. Like I was, this book right now that I was, I'm reading from, and there's a man who made the cover for the book. And that's his passion, he loved that. And he, learned, he went forward in the Tajlid al Qutb, and it's a company. There's a history behind them. Those who do the scholars, these Arabic books, they're the Tajlid. Okay? This book, it's yellow pages. They call it Awraq Tibbi, medical papers. It's good for the eyes, in case you read it on the sun. There's a company that does that. They enjoy that. That's their job. They enjoy that. The Sheikh who wrote the book, he enjoys the knowledge. But if all of them like doing the cover, who's going to write the book? You see my point? Everyone plays a role in this religion. Salahatan. Hadahu. Everyone plays a role. But you need to find your place where you find, you enjoy, you find relevance in. It's very important. The second question it should answer uh, with a yes is, is this the right time? Is this the, the right time? Is it the right time for me to do it? It might be good, but not necessarily the right time. <coughs> the third question that it should answer is, does this match 
my other efforts and my other needs? Does it match up to it? What did I say before? I said that the wise person is the one whose efforts do not, can, they do not push one over the other or you, they don't get in each other's way. A wise person is the one who has a mother and he has a wife and he has a daughter. He's, he's strong enough to make sure that his mother and his wife, they're not getting at each other. Strong wise man. He knows how to make everything. Makes mum happy, makes the wife happy, makes the daughter happy, makes everything go smoothly. That's a smart person. He's able to do that. He's also able to keep his business running and he knows how to keep his household running. Some men are very weak. They come home from work and what do they do? They let out everything onto who? To the wife. They, sh they think she's the business partner, the investor. Who's... And so he's yelling at her. And he's like, I didn't do anything. It wasn't me. Because it's a sign of weakness. Sabahatun. It is. If you look at the Prophet's life, alayhi salatu salam, one of the things that he had was the way he dealt with everybody. And everything just ran smooth. His companions, his wives, his children, everything. That's a strength. So, any task that you're doing, anything that you're doing, a business, you need to have the ability to not let one hit the other or come against each other. What's it, what's it going to do? It's going to slow you down. Are we all together? If you have a problem at home with your wife and you're the khatib who's meant to do the khutbah and in the khutbah you're like, subhanAllah, what is she doing? And you're writing the khutbah and then you go and you stand on the pulpit and you have that issue with you and then you do the... You have to be strong enough to keep that out. Now it's the khutbah time. Now it's the work time. Now it's the family time. And I need to get... I just need to stop thinking about the work. Relevance. It falls under that. If you do have that ability, brothers, and you work on it and you master that, and I'm telling you, it's not easy. It's a hard thing to do. We react to our nature and the things around us. We do. But those are one of the things that slow down a person from attaining their goal. Like, for example, if your business goes down, that whole day you're at home, you're grumbling, you're shut, you're in bed, you're not coming out, mm, no, just bring me tea in bed. Are you going to do anything that day? If you react to everything around you every time, are you ever going to achieve your goal? Huh? Are you? You have to be strong and say, that was life. You know, we have to keep moving. Am I the right person to reach this goal? Am I the right person to reach this goal? And the reason I say this is because sometimes when you have a business, the person, some people are very bad when it comes to delegating responsibilities. He takes everything. He runs the website, he does the social media, he's the, he's the investor, everything. He's the security, he does everything. And he doesn't delegate the responsibilities. And wallahi, I've seen this, subhanAllah, with my own two eyes, especially in da'wah. A brother will come and say, yeah, I'm going to be the CEO of the, company, of the pro Islamic project. Baki, you're a good speaker, but you're not a good manager. It's not, you're not, it's not your field of expertise. We're all together. You're not good at running a project. You have to admit that. It's not a bad thing. Allah didn't make me perfect. I'm a good teacher. This is Don't ask me to run a company. I'm not a good security. I'll let everybody in. I'm a bad security guard. You see, don't ask me to, to, to prepare a, a day out for the center of... I'm sorry, nothing's going to be prepared. That's not my field of expertise. And people get angry if you say, Akhi, you're not good at that. But you don't know this. This is not something you're good at. He thinks he's good at everything. And so he takes the re every responsibility and it always collapses. It always collapses. Every project that you do with this person is collapsing. So one of the, to show maturity and a wisdom of a person is when he says, Akhi, with all due respect, I know I like this. Can you take this role? It's very important. Because what you want, brothers, at the end of the day, is things to happen. I don't care who does it. I just need goals. I just need goals at the end of the day. Whether I do it, whether Alan does it, whether Fulan does it, I really don't care. Just, it has to be done. So, 
you ask yourself that question. Am I the right person? And be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Those are the questions that all of it has to be yes, 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 and then it's relevant. It's relevant. The fifth one that I want to mention before the salah, because I'm going to move on to another point, inshallah ta'ala, is time bound. The time bound. How long do you want to spend on this task? A lot of people don't write down deadlines for themselves. They have no deadlines. When are you planning to, inshallah ta'ala, launch this project? When are you planning to author this book? When do you want to finish the recording of this book? I personally, with myself, anything I haven't given a deadline, I tend to never finish doing it. I don't have a deadline for it. I generally don't finish. I don't generally give my fullest. Because I have no deadline. It's, it's open. So I'm just going to keep going. But when I know there's a deadline I have to meet, I make sure it's done. Now, if you do not write the, again, the, the achievable deadline, a realistic deadline, you're going to stress out. That deadline, if you say to yourself, three months, then just make it four or five months extra. Have you ever ordered food when you're hungry? Huh? Have you ever ordered food when you're hungry? Ah, you, you, everything, can I have this? Yeah, I don't think, this is, I don't think this burger is going to be enough. Can you make it three burgers? Uh, can I have extra chips? You order a lot and then later you just start nibbling through the first burger and you're like, subhanAllah, who's going to eat the other two? That's all. When a person leaves, when a person's asp aspiration comes out from reading these books and seeing someone, they go home. Oh, Allah, I'm going to make this happen. And when they go home, they set themselves what? Yeah, the, the, the time that you set yourself is not realistic. And you get what? You get stressed out. SubhanAllah, I'm a failure in life. I can never do it. So, time. A time-bound goal will usually answer these questions. When? You ask when. You say to the person, when am I going to do this? When is it going to happen? When is it going to be executed? When, when, when? <coughs> Number two. And some people just think, when, if I answer that when, oh, that's good, alhamdulillah, I've actually given it a time bound. No. Because in that time, what did I say that you need to do? Task progression. You need to see how much you progress, right? So you say, so if you say, I'll do it in two years, you have to say, uh, what can I do in three months? In three months, while I'm doing that task, where should I have to see that I reached? Are we all together? So within three months, and I generally use the word three months. The reason is because I call three months the probation period. Like probation period. Generally, three months after, the person gets the hang of things. In the UK, it's three months if they want to give you a permanent job. Sah? Sahih. That's how it is, to three months, probation period. Those three months, you see, okay, yeah, my routine. After generally three months, you get into the habit, alhamdulillah. What do you do? You get into the habit. So you set yourself a three months. You say, what can I do three months from now? The ultimate goal is maybe one year or two years. But three months, where do I have to be? Where do I have to be? That's not enough. Then what do you do? You, you make it less. Because again, when it's three months, you're going to be like, yeah, three months is far. Then you say it lesser. You say, what can I do three weeks from now? Are we all together? And the reason why I, I say three weeks is because I said three months, so let's just make it three weeks. And I love all of it. And last but not least, which is the most important question, what can I do today? Because if you say the word tomorrow, 
Oh, we failed again. You just say, I'm, I'm going to start everything from tomorrow. Anything you tend to say tomorrow never comes. It'll just never come. So you say, what am I going to do today? Are we all together? Sometimes you might say, I'm going to sleep early. Which is a good thing. Because I'm, I'm going to get ready for tomorrow. That may be a good, that might be what you have to do today. But you have to set yourself a, a starting point. Something has to happen today. A little movement has to happen today. Are we all together? Anything that you want to do, if that same day you don't start something, then the procrastination problem starts. So, am I making sense? No? I am? It's important. Okay, now that I finished those five, I want to come to a very important thing that generally I really want you brothers and sisters to pay attention. And this is where our religion, our deen, comes with a solution for, for this. Please pay attention to this. All of that I mentioned are efforts, the smart goal that I just mentioned, are all efforts that you need to come with, true or false? Yeah? Do you all agree? In terms of your what? In terms of the work that you want to do. So, there's something else that you have to personally do to Allah, as you and Allah have to have for any of that to ever happen. None of that will happen if Allah doesn't want it. Because all of those words I just mentioned, smart, it falls under the ayah, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا إِلَّا إِنْشَاءُ you wanna, You're wishing to do all of this, it won't happen unless Allah wills it. So the question is, the golden question for today's seminar is, what can I do to earn that privilege from Allah Azza wa to be able to accomplish my goal, to benefit from my time. Are we all together? That's what we're going to talk about right now, inshallah ta'ala. The first thing is you have to be sincere. Sincerity. Al-ikhlas. Sincerity. These six that I'm going to go through now, six points, are all al wasail al the means that will aid you and support you in benefiting from your time and making sure you achieve what you want in life. These are things that you have to do. Are we all together? Al-ikhlas. Sincerity, brothers and sisters, is a very big thing. Sincerity means <coughs> You clean your heart You purify from your heart You cleanse from your heart From what? Anything other than Allah From the minute you get up The minute you go to sleep All of it is for Allah And Allah told us in the Quran إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ مَنْ أَحْسَنَ عَمَلًا Allah does not forsake the righteous person. The sincere person is what? He's righteous. He's not. What did I just say? Who is the one that procrastinates us? Who did I just say? Shaitan is the one who's trying to make us procrastinate. Sah? So pay attention. Shaitan promised when we were taken out of Jannah, he said to Allah, I'm going to misguide all of your creation except who? Except the slaves who are what? Sincere. The people. So if you've got shaitan out of the way, what do you have, brothers? That's it. You're good. No procrastination, brothers. Comes through what? It comes through sincerity, Allah. Hey, Wallah, it's very important. Nabiullah Yusuf, when the woman wanted to do haram with him, what did Allah do? Allah protected Yusuf from it. Why? Allah says, Because he was from our slaves who were sincere. From the slave, he was a sincere person. 
Allah ta- problems Allah is going to protect you from. Allah is going to make for you angels. Protection. Allah is going to take care of you. With sincerity, you're going to get far, brothers. Am I making sense? Even your dunya things be sincere. If you're going to work and your plan is to, to get rid of another person's job and make him lose, you started on an evil path. You started on a what? Is that Isha? False alarm. Pay attention here. The person who has a motive, evil mindset, doesn't get anywhere. Be mukhlas. And Allah will, plan, will make everything work for you. Sincerity is amazing. You know what he said, Abdullah ibn Abbas? Wallahi, this word, write it with thought if you have it. What did he say? He said, Inna al-mar'a A person yanalu al-ilma biqadri niyati A person will attain knowledge and understanding all based on his intention, his sincerity. Allah will just open your heart, pour everything in there. Your business, you'll understand everything you want to do at work. Your first day at the training, Allah opens your heart. You're a sincere person. You're a sincere person. Your heart is clean. There's nothing in there. It's a clean vessel. Everything's just going to go in there. Sincerity, brothers. Clean your heart. Surrender it to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah doesn't, doesn't, Allah never forsakes a person who surrenders to him. Give it to him and Allah will control your affairs. Al-Ikhlas. Are we all together about this? What's the first thing that we, we, we have to come with? Sincerity. Number two is, As-Sidq fi talab As-Sidq fi talab means, you are truthful in what you're doing. Some of you might say, isn't that sincerity? No. No, it's not. Sincerity means that you're doing it only for Allah. Lakin as-sidqu means this thing that you're doing, you're not associating partners with this thing. If, you're, if you've got a business project that you're trying to do, do it by itself. Don't try to run a little business on the side as well. And you know what I mean? Like another thing, just do it by itself. Don't multitask. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ يَشْ You don't have two hearts, brother. You can only do one thing at a time. You can't hear two people at the same time. The same way that you can't hear two people at the same time is the same way that you can't what? You can't do two tasks at the same time. I don't even know who came up with this word, multitasking. Is that even true? Can you multitask at the same time, do two things at the same time? The minute that you do it, you, it will, it's impossible. You're doing one and then you do the other one. Are we all together? You can't breathe and eat at the same time. Can you? From your mouth, of course. But you, even when you swallow something, you don't breathe. You stop breathing. Sah? Your body parts don't do things at this. There's no, I don't know who came up with this term, multitasking. It's not going to happen, brothers. It has to be a sit of a funnel. Give your heart, your mind, your energy, everything to this. Are we all together? A sit Truthfulness. Don't associate partners with whatever you're doing. Do it by itself. Put your head to it. Plan it out. Execute it. And anything that you give, all of it to it, it will give you something back in return. When the scholars, they used to say, Man ilma kullah. Anyone who gives knowledge, all of his heart and his mind, what does knowledge do? It gives you something back in return. Something. But if you give something to knowledge, it gives you nothing in return. You have to give your heart, your mind, your wealth, your everything. That's when it's going to look at you and say, okay, I feel sorry for you. Do this then. Are we all together? The third one is, Al-Himma Al-Aliya, high aspiration. High, 
high aspiration. The person has to have these are characteristics that you need to come with. You have to have high aspiration. And patience. High aspirations are what? A person with high aspiration is patient. Does he give it up easy? If you are trying to achieve something, you're gonna have to come with patience. I'll tell you a story. There was a young boy. His teacher, he said to his teacher, teacher, I wanna come to the masjid. A young boy. He said, Sheikh, I wanna come to the masjid and I wanna be at the front row. And I want to make it for the first row in the Salah. And the Sheikh said to him, you have to come early. And so the young boy at night, he told his mother, wake me early up before the Salah. And so his mother woke him up early. He woke up early. He left the house without his mother's knowledge. He went to the masjid and he found that the door of the masjid was locked. Being a young kid, he was able to go through a small hole that he saw from within the masjid. And when he went in, he fell inside the masjid and there was a sharp object facing upwards. And he went into his leg and he bled. And then he sat at the front row bleeding. And so the sheikh came into the masjid, saw the young boy, but the young boy did not say anything. He prayed the salah. And when he prayed the salah, the sheikh turned around and there was a puddle of blood. And so he said to him, what happened to you? And he said, sheikh, this is the story. I tried to come to the masjid. I wanted to make it for the front row. And the sheikh said to him, Uktub ya bunaya. My son, write down what I'm going to say to you. He said, Dabibta li majdi wa sa'una qad balagu jahdan nufusi wa alqaw dunahu al-uzra wa kabidu al-majda hatta malla aktharuhum wa aniq al-majda man awfa wa man sabara. La atahsabanna al-majda tamran anta akiluhu lan tablugha al-majda hatta talaka sabara. In summary, what he said to him is, young boy, he said, you wanted to earn a goal. You wanted to achieve something. You wanted to pray at the front row. And it wasn't something easy. It had a cost and a price to it. Don't ever think to yourself, oh my son, he said. Don't ever think to yourself that honor and status and a position is like a fruit that you take from a tree like this. No, you have to go and sacrifice time and effort. You're never going to gain what you're looking for unless you exert a lot of hard work and you show patience. Sheikh Ibn Baz, he was what? He was the Mufti Al-Ami in Mamlakat al Arabi in Saudi He was the second Mufti of Saudi Arabia. The first Mufti was Muhammad Ibn Ibrahim al -Sheikh. And the second one was Ibn Baz. A man came to Ibn Baz after many years of da'wah and calling the people to the deen of Allah. And this man exerted so much effort and hard work and he, and then he gave up. And so he came to Ibn Baz and he complained. He said, Sheikh, I have done everything to call my people to the deed. I've tried, I've exerted every effort there is. But Sheikh, they are not willing to listen. So Sheikh Ibn Baz, he said, give, give me your hand. Give me your palm. And so he grabbed him by the palm. And Sheikh Ibn Baz, he said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amu sbiru wa sabiru wa rabitu wa attaqullaha when did when was success mentioned? Tuflihun means you're gonna attain success when it comes with four things. From those four things is patience. From those four things is patience. And you guys look up the second the other three. The ayah is ayah two hundred ayah two hundred surah to Ali Imran. Ayah two hundred. Surah Ali Imran. So, the ayah, Ya ladil amos, biru, be patient. That's the first one. If you're not patient, how are you going to attain la'alakum tuflihun? How are you going to find success that you're looking for? Are you going to gain it? You're not going to gain it. In order to gain it, what do you need? You have to come with these four. From them is patience. Some, from those, Nabi Allahi, Nabi Allahi Musa, when, we, when he went with Khadir, what was the thing that Nabi Lai Musa did not show? Patience. And if Nabi Lai Musa showed patience, we would have known even more. 
True or false? Huh? We would have known more. And so sometimes lack of patience makes you not get what you're looking for. Just by patience, things become clear for you. Walidalika, the scholars they say, Asabru Matiya Tullayadillu Rakibuha. Patience is a is a boat that if you go on, you'll never get lost. You'll never get lost. You reach your destination. One way or another. You will reach your uh, you reach it. Sometimes you will have to sacrifice for whatever you're trying to achieve so much effort until you say, I haven't eaten for days. I haven't eaten for days. وَلِذَلِكَ الْإِمَامَ مَالِكٍ He said, إِنَّ هَذَا الْأَمْرَ This matter, this religion, لا يُنَالُ A person cannot gain it حَتَّى يُدَاقَ فِيهِ طَعْمُ الْفَقْرِ Until the person tastes poverty. A man came to an Imam al-Shafi'i and he said, I want to become a scholar of hadith. I want to take the path of hadith. And an Imam, an Imam al-Shafi'i said to him, I'm going to give you the glad tidings of poverty that's not going to leave you. After he told him he wants to become a scholar of hadith, he said, well, this is what comes with it. This is price. This is its price. The fourth thing that a person needs to come with is whatever you've gained it has to show on you it has to what it has to it has to show it has to be on you even if it can be applied on your your university and whatever qualifications if you study at university, and whatever you studied, it goes back to the concept of relevance, right? If you go back home, and you don't use that qualification, and you just stick it on the wall, are you going to remember what you studied? Huh? Whatever training that you did, if you don't use it into your day-to-day -to -day life, it goes. So in order to gain what you're looking for, you have to start using it. Are we all together? وَلِذَلِكَ Allah gives you the knowledge of this religion. He'll give you something. You won't be given anything else unless you implement what was already given to you. Remember that. Whatever was given to you, first of all, implement that. Have you implemented it? Then here's more. Just like a mother when she feeds her child, when she puts a food in his mouth, he first of all has to swallow what was given to him. Huh? Would she keep putting things in his mouth? Yeah. Would she? Yeah? No, not at all. She wouldn't. She will stop. Until he swallows what's already in there. That's the same with implementing knowledge. Allah will not give you more unless you've taken in what was given to you in the first place. Let it show on your limbs. Or else, you're just going to be a person who's gathered information. And Imam Shafi'i, he said, Knowledge is not what's memorized. It is what? Knowledge is what benefited you. How, how does it benefit you? It shows on your limbs. It shows on your? It shows on your limbs. The fifth one I want to talk about, inshallah ta'ala, is Adamu al-isti'ajal. Adamu al-isti'ajal. Bitalab al-nata'ij wa thimar. Don't hasten, brother. Don't hasten, sister. Somebody comes to a class for the first time and they want to be able to understand it like the teacher. Brother, this is your first class. You've just come in. You're a newborn baby in the field. It's going to take you time to understand this information. You, you want to take it all at once? You want to be like Ibn Taymiyyah in two, three lessons? And I'm not going to blame a lot of people for feeling that way because it's some of the courses that the way that they are promoted is after three weeks. You're going to be a what? 
They're going to be expert in the Arabic language. <laughs> Three weeks they're going to be expert in the Arabic language. Thirty years you won't be an expert in the Arabic language. I remember when Sheikh said to a talib, a student who graduated from the Jamia Medina, and the student was leaving, and he said to the Sheikh, Sheikh, advise me, I'm going to go back to the UK. The Sheikh gave him many, many wise advices, and the first advice that he gave him was, he said to him, my son, this is Abdul Rizak ibn Abdul Muhsa Abad, he said to the brother, my son, after you've graduated from the Jamia, those six years in the Jamia was there to teach you that you don't know nothing. Now your journey to seeking knowledge has started. Six years was to show you you have nothing. Now you learnt what you lack and what you don't know. You're going back to the country you were from. Now you need to learn knowledge. Are we all together, brothers? That brother left his family for six years. Imagine that. In the Arabian Peninsula. And he stayed there. And that's the truth. The reason why he was teaching him that is a lot of people, what they do is when they graduate, when they study, when they learn for a couple of years, or when they go to a course or intensive course here and this and that, they think that's it. I have mastered it. Adam al Isti'jal. Don't be hasty. Whatever you're trying to do, hastiness is not a good characteristic. Are we all together, brothers? One of the things that really shocked me when I read is that hastiness is never, never praiseworthy. That Nabiullah, Musa alayhi salam, what did he do? He hastened to Allah and he left his people without nurturing them. صح? He didn't nurture his people correctly and he left. And so Allah said to him when he came, to Nabi Musa, فَمَا عَجَلَكَ عَنْ قَوْمِكَ يَا مُوسَى Musa, what made you hasten from your people? And then he said, قَالَ هُمْ أُولَاءِ عَلَىٰ أَثَرِ وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ رَبِّ لِتَرْضَى Oh Allah, those people were guided, they were upon the right path, I have come to you, I hasten to you. And some scholars, they took from that, that Nabi Musa did not finish off the mission, he hastened without finishing the mission. The, the goal that was set to him. And remember who he was running to. Allah Azza wa Jalla. And then Allah told him, no, 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 no. The people that you left behind, they got misguided. They got misguided. And then if you hasten something, you don't do a good job. You don't. But Allah said in the Quran, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ جُمْلَةً وَاحِدًا كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ وَرَتَّلْنَاهُ تَرْتِيلًا the disbelievers, they said, Muhammad, why does the Quran, all of it come down at once? Just quickly. Just happen once. And then what did Allah say? The reason why the Quran was sent down in stages gradually is So it can stick to the heart. It will resonate in the heart more. And people can memorize it better. Something that is done gradually, it is done step by step will remain and it will last then something that is done fast and quick so if you want to achieve your goal take your time one of my shuyukh my mashayikh I truly benefited from took great knowledge from he used to in his maktaba he would he would he would compare manuscripts, old Islamic manuscripts. He wants to make them a published book. And so the masjid at the top building, the sheikh would be at the top, at the top, top building. Uh, and down you come is the masjid. So I went with him one day. When I went with him, I used to go to him every day. I used to read, every day I used to come to him and I used to read the kitab Shafi'ila li tirmidhi on him. And he would explain it for us. Or explain it for me. It was just me and him. When I go up, he's got a couple of manuscripts. And the way he compares the manuscript is so hard. He looks at word for word. And this is like volumes of books. He looks at this word. He puts his glasses down. 
he looks at it and then he looks at that manuscript and then he looks at the other manuscript and then he writes it down and once he writes it down he verifies what he wrote and what the and in my head I'm like Sheikh when are you ever going to finish this book and you know what he said to me Al-ajalatu min shaytan and his is from shaytan and he said to me, it's not authentically tra- uh, attributed to the Prophet, but the meaning is correct. Hastiness is from shaitan. SubhanAllah, he brought, he, he brought out that book, and it's amazing. Amazing. Are we all together? And so I learned from that, SubhanAllah, ta'anni and tarawi, diligent, is a noble characteristic, wallah. To be calm, to take your time, do a qu- it's quality, brothers and, not, and sisters. It's not quantity, quality. Take your time. I saw that um, that's common in the Muslims. I'll give you an example. Yus, the Prophet ﷺ, he came by his companions being banned, bashed and being hit and murdered in Mecca. It's true or false? Sahabas were being killed. Ammar ibn Yasir, he came by him and what did the Prophet said? Isbiru ya ala yasir fa inna mu'idukum al-jannah Be patient. Jannah is your final abode. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came by other companions. And so one of the companions that came to him was Khabbab. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ala tansur lana. Are you not going to give us victory? Ala tad'u lana. Are you not going to supplicate for us? Are you not going to bring us a solution for this problem that we're in? And then the Messenger said something very powerful. What did he say? He said, Wallahi innaw la yaseeru al-raakibu min san'a ila hadra mawt. That a riding beast will come from Sana'a and it will go to Hadramaut. A riding beast. Camels and sheep will go from there. Sana'a ila Hadramaut. Or a person will come from Sana'a to Hadramaut. La yakhafu, he doesn't fear. Illa dhib min ghanami. Only the wolf to eat his goats. The road is so safe. Everything is safe. He's not scared of anything. And the Sahaba, the Prophet said to them, he said to them, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ You guys are hastening. You, are, you quickly want to see the victory of Islam like that. Give it time. And sometimes when the Muslim looks around the world and he sees what's taking place, he starts to want to get solutions today. Answers have to be made now, this minute, this second. No, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ You're hasty. It takes its time. Are we all together? وَلَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ Hastiness never brings a solution. It doesn't bring solution. What brings solution is التَّأَنِّي وَالتَّرَوِّي It's important. وَلِذَلِكَ A lot of people, the reason why they push themselves forward when they're not qualified is the concept of istijal, hastiness. The poet, what did the scholars they say? مَنِ اسْتَعْجَلَ شَيْءٌ قَبْلَ أَوَانِهِ عُقِبَ بِحِرْمَانِ التمشخ, the person making himself a sheikh, an alama, a scholar, before their time has actually reached, it came from what? Hastiness. You just want to see the results quickly. It takes time and it needs patience. It, t- it needs patience. The last point that I want to conclude with, inshallah ta'ala, is mulazamatul ulama. Stay with the scholars and stick with the people, ulama, the people of knowledge. وَأَخْذِ الْعِلْمِ عَنْهُمْ And take the knowledge from them. And this point, I want to say something which is, the ulama I'm talking about is the scholars of the religion, the deen. Go back to them. Stick with them. They are the ones, wallahi, that can bring us out of azamat, the problems that we're in, the harm that we're in. They will guide us through the Qur'an and the sunnah and their wisdom and the age that they, have, they are in. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith, "Min alamat al-saa'a." From the signs of the hour is an yultamas al-ilm in the asalir. That knowledge will be sought from the youngsters. A young person will be the scholar of the town, and he will be the scholar of the village. The knowledgeable people who, when calamities fall, issues happen, is the scholars. Ahlul ilm, the senior people in age and wisdom. They're the ones that we go to and we ask them. And that could be used for our worldly knowledge as well. We go to the, if you want to do business, 
you should always have experts that you go back to. True or false? Or your business is not going to flourish. And it's not going to go forward. You need experts on the committee who can tell you that's wrong, don't do this. Those people that you're going to choose, they're going to be very senior in age. They're going to have deep knowledge. They're going to have insight. Isn't that not the case? Isn't that not the case? So why is it many people that have businesses, they consult expertise in the field, they take strategies from these experts, but they never have scholars on their board that they, res they ask questions. Is this a riba? Is it permissible? What type of transaction is this? Are we allowed to do this? Are we all together, brothers? Why is that not done? Why we don't do that in our day-to-day -day life? Why don't we go back to these senior people of knowledge? I believe all of those points that I mentioned, those six points, if a person comes with it, and all of the other points that I mentioned, you will benefit from your time and you will see results, insha'Allah ta'ala. And as I said to you before, this life that we have today is an opportunity. One time. You're never going to get this opportunity again. Don't come the day of judgment and you regret what you have seen. It becomes clear to you the day of judgment that which you were not expecting. Don't let that happen to you. Work, exert effort. Allah has given us a chance today. Today He's given us a chance, an opportunity. We can work hard. We can do good now. So when we go the day of judgment, we have good that's waiting for us on the other side. I ask Allah from the bottom of my heart that He subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the strength and the ability to be able to fulfill that which pleases Him and to come with righteous actions and stay away from that which He is... Uh, that angers him and is not pleased with anything I might have said in this whole seminar any mistakes or shortcomings that have come from me is from me and shaitan and Allah and his messenger are free from it subhanakallahumma bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha illallah astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayki